Hey everyone, we're back with another episode of the Knife Nuts Podcast, the show that brings you the best and worst the knife community has to offer. How are you guys doing? I'm good. Glad to be back. We're awesome. Yeah, I'm doing good. Well, that's a change. I did not expect that at all. <laughs> I I went shooting today. I just got back from shooting. I'm I'm uh I'm exhilarated. Right oh, now. it's a good thing we didn't record last Thursday then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we were last Thursday was last Thursday was not a good day for me. Uh, the my customers have been driving me nuts for about two weeks now, so it's uh, I was pretty bitter last week. <laughs> if, if you could believe that, yeah. <laughs> uh, never. And speaking of <clears throat> speaking of your shooting trip, public service announcement to schools in Croatia. Did you see the, the first <laughs> comment? Was was like a child in Croatia saying, uh, uh, "Oh, I need one of those for when school starts." Yeah, what was that about? <laughs> I, was like, I did oh, see that, and I didn't even God. comment on it. I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to ignore the whole post right do now. Do we do we <laughs> call the Croatian FBI? Do they have one? Who knows? Too far away for me to care. I wonder if he's he's the same kid like from Belgium that was asking me to buy one of my knives. I will have one knife, please. Do you think it's Dalibor Bergam's son? <laughs> It's the only Croatian uh, I know. Yeah. No, one no we got to get Gavko to go back there and rescue that kid and stop him from shooting up that school. He's yeah, the only one that can I, do it. I do hope that, that nothing happens there. Oh, wait, no, Gavko Slovakian. <laughs> anyway. Wow, this is off to a great start. Yeah. To our, to all of our, we apologize profusely to all of our Croatian listeners. All, none of you. We love you, Croatia. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we. I promise you, uh, thanks to Dave, we actually have a little more structure this week. Yeah. Well, do we want to talk about anything new? Because there is some new stuff for me. I don't know about you guys. Oh, God, there's so we have so much new stuff. And maybe yeah. you guys can help me figure something out because cause I'm, I'm actually on the fence about I'm trying to buy one of the, the new uh, Liang Ma uh, Kuf, KUF. The kitchen utility folder, yeah. Yes, and I can't decide which one. Oh, I can tell you. Which one are you going to The carbon tell? fiber one. The... You see, everyone says the carbon fiber, but I've got yeah. some... <sighs> the, My car looks weird. It's just like the, that color is weird. It looks like an old Werther's original that's like been left <laughs> out in the sun. <laughs> Have you ever had a Werther's original? They're delicious. Yeah. Do you, what, do you want that on your knife? And also, you look weird, <laughs> but we keep you around. All right. Yeah, you know what else is delicious? I don't have something prepared. Shit. <laughs> Go to the next person. But I see what you're saying. Chicken so, feet. That's where I was going with that. Oxtail. I, yeah. Oxtail is delicious. I've yeah, oxtail is delicious. Feet. Do you want an oxtail handle? Probably not. I mean, that, if you made it from the bones, I think that would actually be kind of cool. Brian, make that happen. Yo, yeah. You know what? We need some weird animal part handles because uh, they're not making the pony knife, Grant and Gavin Hawk, and that used to have horse hoof handles. So... <laughs> Make the first oxtail folder. Mm, yeah, no thanks. It would it will go it will go wonderfully with the Caribbean community. Yo, you know what? You'd have you'd have a, a buyer lined up. Brian Dunn loves things made from sheep, so mm. it would be a done deal. <laughs> I, know, I, I like a couple parts made from a sheep. <laughs> um, it would be a good way, a good way to use all those uh, donkey carcasses coming out of uh, the cold steel factory. <laughs> Callback. Yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah. We're on fire tonight. Yes. Yeah, yeah but no, really, really, the the integrated backspacer on the carbon fiber version looks a lot cooler. Yes, Jake, did you notice that? So the carbon. I, did, I, I well, all I saw was that the he said something to the tune of there were three hundred that my carta was limited to three hundred pieces. I think he said not even close. It's even way uh, less than like, that. Yeah, there's like ninety of the carbon fiber one, and like. 30 or so of the... I can't remember. 90 carbon fiber, 40 my car. Okay, see? There you go. Okay. Is that because the carbon... On. Is that because the micarta looks like a Werther's original? Oh, well, it's apparently Westinghouse, although you always think of, like, the lighter colored, like, the ivory yeah, colored like one, ivory wedding, colored one as Westinghouse, so, like, I guess this is vintage micarta, but it's, like, not exciting looking at all, so... I just like to say Westinghouse. I mean, West... I mean, it is cool, like, the history of it is, is very cool, but, like, this isn't the Westinghouse everyone thinks of. I don't know the history of Westinghouse micarta. I mean, it was just... It was made a long time ago, and it was used as insulators and stuff, and that company's still around today doing... Um, they used to make a ton of stuff. They make elevators. Uh, they did science outreach. 
they paid people to go to schools and teach science. Like Westinghouse did a lot of stuff, so it's kind of cool to have their. Uh, I was going to say it sounds like a publishing company that maybe made some sort of scholastic books. I think there is a Westinghouse <laughs> publishing company. It, probably it, pro- it probably is the same thing. Yeah, but anyway, that that looks like a nice knife. But um, yeah, but I mean, I'm sure Leong I... will give you a good deal on it. Leong is 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 a great dude, and I'm going to be getting it directly from him. Yeah, I was going to say excited. not to, not to blow the spot up, but that place Night of Outlet also sells Riot products for under map. So, you know, if you guys are interested, well, yeah, top tip. Yeah. <laughs> what else is anybody Always getting? Plugging the Chinese, great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, at least it's a, it's a friend of ours, friend of the podcast. Um, yes, I got a bunch of stuff. No, I'm not talking about it. I'm I'm, I'm talking. About- Riot. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, not talking, I'm not talking about Liang. <laughs> I thought we had beef with Liang. I was gonna be like, all right, I missed that. Uh, no. no, I love him. He's an awesome dude. Okay, yes, shout out to you, Liang. Uh, I got a bunch of stuff in. So, and you guys know what the most important one is. But I'll start small. Uh, oh yeah. Really small. And since this is going to be a maintenance episode, I'll talk about this. The Falneven CC4. It's a little pocket stone. It's two sided. Um, and it's supposed to be ceramic on both sides, which it is, but it's advertised as one micron and 0.1 micron, which couldn't be farther from the truth. And it's not really a surprise that a $20 sharpening stone does not have a 0.1 micron <laughs> um, <laughs> ceramic on it, since that would be 160,000 grit. So it's it's a good it's a good little pocket stone, but it is not what it's advertised. So I'll even should probably update that shit. Not enough grit. No, really, it's 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 very far from that, but it's nice. Uh, I got in one of those new Kershaw Emersons. I bought it on a total whim, the CQC 10K. It's based off the Appalachian, and I really like that design. You know, it's a forty dollar knife. There's not much to say about it. It was it was good. I gave it to a friend. Uh, I bought a lot of those when they first came out and gave them all away. Yeah, yeah, they're good. They're good knives to give away because they're I, not flippers, so. and people like I, can't handle flippers. It's like they have cerebral palsy. Like every single we, person that's not a knife person. <laughs> Between Levon and I, we bought I think every iteration at uh, for the purpose of giving them away or or just to check them out. And a couple months later, when that um, the XL version came out, it distinctly seemed to have come from a different factory, had a very completely different level of QC and and quality. Would you say that the one you just got was kind of like subpar or it was centered? I don't know. Par? It, was, it was centered <laughs> and it had a pretty good detent. So. I'll say it was decent, okay. but like the Kershaw, I mean the 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 Chinese made Kershaws are junk in comparison to like real steel or like Rake that's, or some that's of these where other I was going with that. other that's exactly Chinese where brands. I was going. Yeah. yeah, they're like total yeah. junk in comparison. But my mom, my mom has bought two of the CQC eight. Is that the Tanto one with the black G10 and the steel frame, steel frame lock? The seven K. There's so many of them. Maybe it's the seven K. Whatever. It's the Tanto one. My mother of all people has bought two. Of that same knife because she likes it so much. Yeah. To make up for our Westinghouse digression, I'll say another top tip. The Kershaw Injection 3.0, you can get that thing for like $10 now. Well, that's a good knife for 10 bucks. Yeah. Like, it has mm-hmm. contour G10 scales. It's nice for $10. It's an incredible knife for $10. But I also got in the Boker Plus Lateralis, the Jason Stout uh, production. Oh, yeah. It's awesome. It really is as good as everyone's been saying really 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 well done it's 70 bucks you get d2 g10 or stainless steel stainless steel frame lock but honestly you can't even tell it feels like a well-made titanium frame lock i love it really I'm very impressed with it yeah hmm. it's it's great flips really well it seems like no one's gotten a bad one yet so that's really a surprise and then the most important knife the one that ruins our objectivity and turns this podcast into the brian nadeau fellatio hour you mean your objectivity? Everyone's objectivity. We're all compromised now because we all have them. I finally got a sharp by design knife, and it's a cyclone. Yay. And it's awesome. Yay. It's exactly what I hoped for. Uh, Brian was kind enough to make it more gray for me, and I love it. <laughs> so would you have told him if it sucked? I, I mean, I will say that I think it is thicker behind the hedge than I would like. That's my complaint about it. It's my only complaint. <laughs> I, did, I knew it wasn't going to suck. I've handled them before. You don't see anyone Good saying answer. anything bad about them, so it's not like I'm going to magically have a problem with it. I, and as for your ruined objectivity, it's not like you got it directly from him. You got it uh, second, you know, secondhand yeah. from a from very, a very true. I did get it secondhand private seller, so it's it's not a true, uh, you know. Okay, we know. we still have some objectivity here. You did yeah, deal exactly. it out of his pocket, like I like I've been yeah, and it's to it's do. not like he gave it to you for five bucks because you're a you're a fellow 
uh, podcast, bro. You know, th- that would ruin objectivity. But buying it third hand or second hand, you know, third party. Third hand. <laughs> <laughs> if you bought it with if you bought it with your third hand, or if he sold it with his third hand <laughs> and it had been dick smudged, then your objectivity would be ruined for a different reason. I mean if this is the if this is the trademark dick smudge finish, I love it. Yes. <laughs> That's the finish that was on that, that knife uh, from uh, from Blade this year with all the uh, Smudges the highly polished one that. that oh one yeah, yeah, that, that oh, one that you said. Remember that one? We should have <laughs> saved. We should. We should have saved. Smudges. We should have saved this conversation as a segue into our talk about lubrication. Ha ha ha! Well done. Yes, but yeah, well, that, no. that's it for Fail. me. Um, is that it for me? Yeah, that's it for me. That's it. That's it for you. Yeah. Anyone Jake, else? I. I I had a really big disappointment uh, as far as unboxing this week because <clears throat> I I finally found uh, a, a good excuse to buy a clone knockoff version of one of Brian's typhoons <laughs> fr- from I presume the the Kevin John family uh, on nah. the, on the, of the mainland and. Uh, you know, not, we all wanted to get one and as a joke and, and give it to him or send it in for service or something like that. <laughs> but no one wanted to pay like 60, 80, 100 dollars for one. And I found one on, on a flashlight forum <laughs> for next literally next to nothing. And the reason it's disappointing is because we didn't do anything funny with it. Like, I know. We were just so excited that we had it and that we just sent a picture of it basically to him. Like, and no one noticed No one noticed there was a fake in that picture. That was ridiculous yeah. Yeah, on Instagram. No one knows. My mind was blown. Like, no one was like, oh, my God, so cool. Like, I, I, sent, I sent the group a picture. It has multi-row bearings and, like, it, it's actually put together pretty nice. <laughs> And it's very funny, but yeah, um, we totally. I'm, just, I'm sad we didn't do something funny with well, it. Well, if we did, maybe we well, will in the future. Maybe I'll it, make it pink and and uh, sneak it into Levon's collection or something. I don't know. Jake, like if we did, if you did what you said you were going to do, Brian would have had a coronary. That's the other problem is he cares so much. Yes, I was I was going to uh, accept it as uh, as a new buyer, like you know, for one of the. I don't know for for something and send it in for service as a very angry, uh, enraged customer. And we thought that would be a funny way to go about it. But the problem is he cares so much about his product and his reputation. He might have actually had a heart attack. So <laughs> it so might have killed this, me. Yeah. Yes. So my twenty dollar joke turned into like a, a somehow a bad investment. It looks like a decent beat. Whatever. <laughs> I mean, it looks like it's weighed we'll do surprisingly something. well. It has negative detent. Oh yeah, that's what yeah, I figured. The detents from, are always aside trash. Aside from the detent, it, 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 there's no question it's made nicely. Um, you know, aside from the detent and, and yeah, all they, that it's, stuff, it's, but... it's funny because they they didn't even try to like, uh, you know, recreate Brian's detent shoe thing. They just said fuck it, no detent. No, yeah, I, I thought he'd be very excited. They did not attempt the detent. I thought he'd be very sad. However, I sent you a picture of this. They did attempt the pocket. Um, Pocket clip? The clip, right. Yeah, and they succeeded fairly well. Yeah. So I thought you'd be pretty bummed about that. Ah, the detent but, ball is more innovative. Or detent thing. Overall, it feels absolutely... Even though it's like precise and, and it's not a terrible knife objectively, it is nowhere nearly as good as a, as the real thing, obviously. Which I can now attest to. So you still... Yes. <laughs> So you still win, and it's made with very thin stock. So, mm-hmm. and we could so take that as a, as a fact because it's not like you haven't sampled enough of of the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, it doesn't stop the fact that I'm wishing diarrhea upon you right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you can you recover are, you from will, that. Like, if you know us, if you know us, uh, Brian, you you won't have to wish very hard. For that <laughs> <to happen. laughs> I had I had wings for for dinner last night and tonight. Was so it the no same worries. wings from the other night? Yes, it was. So you had wings. That is three savage. Nights in a row. Is three. It, oh wait, three, three nights. Three. Oh my, that is fucking and savage. And by the third night, there was only three or four left, and I I didn't even care. What? The, oh my god. They were so good. Have some have they some dignity. So good. <laughs> that is very funny. With that, I have more I have more dignity in real life than I do on the podcast. I will tell you the the brutal <laughs> ugly truth on the podcast for Super the good of the. For the good of the show. I know we're spinning off the podcast into the reptile report and whatnot. Are we also going to have the bowel movement? Yes. Yeah, that's good. I like that. 
Oh God! Yeah, well, I get it. it's like, a movement. Yeah, yeah. it's a movement. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you play on words. Exactly. Yes. A double on toilet. <laughs> Sorry, that was bad. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so what's next? Oh God! Anyone else got anything in? Is that it? We got so many flashlights. I've got so oh, oh my god, the flashlights. Dude, so many flashlights. Yeah, you've gotten way too many in recently. So we oh, have I changed, I changed the, the color of my neighbor's house. I actually I think I mel- partially melted the bricks on my neighbor's house <laughs> and turned them in, turned them into a lighter shade. Is it a this fucking so laser bright. beam? <laughs> it's uh, so we have lights that now range from about 80 lumens to 16,000 lumens. You have to get that thirty thousand lumen one though. It's gonna happen. I mean, it's a. Fa- it's a well, we're at. We're we're halfway there. It's like at the, yeah. we had it the other night. You put two of them together. Yeah, we have. And we each have a DT seventy, and we were both blind. Yeah, it was it was not good. Did you, by chance, both tape them to your dicks and then try and wave them at each other? Because I feel our, like our, that is our, much more likely. Our dicks would, would burn off in a matter of seconds because this thing. Like gets to a point where it's super nope. Yeah, that's the knife nuts flashlight challenge. It's, something tells me they use them just like Firefly to find each other in the dark to bang each other. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, it's like the uh, what? It's like the bandanas that you used to wear in your back pocket. Yeah, that mm, is, that's not going to hit our audience at all. <laughs> I thought that was just like like you were a fan, you were cosplaying as one of the warriors. I, you know, if anyone caught what that was a reference to, then like shout out to you guys. But... They never no, but it it they work they work very well as a bright light source, but even better as a heat source, which mm. is unfortunate because it gets too hot to touch with within less probably less less than two minutes for sure. Maybe around the one minute mark, you have to just put it down and walk away. I mean, on top of that, like weird. we've had, I have tons of really awesome practical lights. And that that convoy L six for fifty bucks, that thirty eight hundred lumen yeah. uh, thrower, I yeah I love that thing. It's an awesome searchlight, Brian. I'm getting you one. You're gonna flip out. Oh, great! You want me to find you in the dark, don't you? <laughs> I mean, it, it I mean, really why not? it really is awesome how cheap flashlights are. It's like such a fun hobby for way less money than knives. It's giving me a hard hold time for more than two minutes. I don't. Yeah, well, that's that, well, uh, no, well, that, the, that's, that's just, just the ridiculous one. one. Yeah, just the that, ridiculous. I mean, that's one. The a, that's are... a novelty item. Well, yeah. Do smaller flashlights disperse heat even worse? Right, there's less surface area. You have, di- of course, but you have different. You know, certain things use certain amounts of power. Different batteries. You know. Yeah. Uh, there's. That little ray light that I got, which is actually one of the larger ones that I carry, the ray it's got a really stupid name. It's called the pineapple. Yeah, I didn't really understand that, but <laughs> but it is an awesome flashlight. It really hasn't left my pocket. It's probably around I would what would you say it is, Jake? Like maybe 300, 300 lumens or something like that. But it has a really warm tint. It's very well made. It doesn't get too hot. It's a great light to carry. Yeah, to be fair, some of them don't get hot at all. The, right. the heat thing is strictly it's something that that comes into play when you uh, over, you know, when you're in the, something when you're in the phase of flashlight collecting that mimics the phase of knife collecting where you only buy uh, clones or knockoffs or something like that. Yeah, where it's all just for novelty. How of, many lumens can I get? These yeah, these flashlights kind of remind me of like the Spyderco lightweight knives where you have like S110V which is like a ridiculous yeah. steel, which is the same as having like an on insane a, amount of lumens, but then in like a shitty on a handle. plastic. Like yeah. Handle so it's it. like you have this incredible it, capability, yeah. but it's just like not it, all it the way there. It is very much like that because mine, um, not so much with Lavans, but mine came with surprisingly poor, uh, poorly machined threads. Not, not that the whole thing is machined poorly. It's actually nicely made. It has a little screen. The buttons have amazing feedback. This is the Imolent DT70, by the way. So, I still think it was an amazing uh, bargain for what you get and everything. But yeah, as far as the the um, you know similarity to that S one ten V Spider Co. Yeah, having poor poor threads and and whatever other shortcomings, and yet putting out leg- realistically about fourteen thousand lumens Christ. is uh, yeah. Which is it, again, it's a no- it's a novelty to some to some because extent. Uh, the lower lumen, like more practical lights that I have, I think are much better made than that Imolent. Like that, sure. like the convoys and stuff like that. They're they're 
made beautifully. Yeah, Convoy is is the bang for buck. Uh, Astrolux winner at the moment, and Astrolux, Astrolux and Lumen Top are all sort of really doing that a great bang for buck spot. Job. It's weird at because least right now I'm I'm starting with because there's always that plateau. There's there's custom flashlights too, and there's stuff out there that I like and I, I may want to own, but at the same time, like the diminishing returns the you know it, it, you can mm-hmm. you hit that wall very quickly with flashlights in fact i think a lot of the 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 budget light community has a larger thing going on than than the custom light community but and a, a lot know. of people feel that way about knives believe it or not <laughs> and uh well they would be wrong yeah they would just be flat out wrong their their opinion doesn't matter um but yeah no I, when you spend time kind of jumping back and forth between those two communities and um you know if you get into a conversation you see a lot of the same mindset and um decision making and motivation but you can substitute the word flashlight for the word knife when you know people say well you know i spend my money on this but it, it just needs to work so i buy a cheap blank and you could feasibly say that about either of them but you know then you get into custom like mokutai bodied flashlights and custom mokutai framed knives and they're both thousands of dollars and here we are uh talking about edc gear on a podcast so <laughs> whatever there's a time and a place for everything i say have have a nice one of everything or two or whatever and uh and then or 15 know, go, go pay your bills later <laughs> yeah or 15 yeah <laughs> to to draw the people back in with a real juicy story, uh, didn't one of them finally go supernova? One of your flashlights oh, from a very popular one... brand recently, though. Jake, he's Depends talking. On... He's talking about your Olight. Yeah. Oh, oh, the explosion. Yeah, <laughs> you say that so <laughs> casually. <laughs> well, because it was the when you think of an explosion uh, in a flat and like a high power flashlight, anything that has a battery, like a, a lithium polymer, you think of either a plane going down or someone's pocket catching on fire because their like mechanical vape mod had a short or something like that. This wasn't actually none of that. It was just the glass. Um, and I, I don't, I still don't, I haven't looked into it enough. I haven't even talked to them yet. This just happened recently, but I had a light that was just on. I was just kind of doing a little, uh, testing of a, not a new battery chemistry, but an old battery chemistry. Uh, and, and two minutes after I looked away, the, um, the, the glass just positively shattered and under such immense pressure that it basically spread itself throughout the house, which is uh, important because I have little children's crawling and I was going to say, around, it's not so. like you have, you don't have like an infant and a toddler and a dog running around. Yeah. And I was barefoot too at the time. So <laughs> uh, I have not, maybe it's because I'm, uh, you know, not as knowledgeable about flashlights as I should be, but I haven't heard of that, um, of the, the glass shatter, a flashlight story before I've, we've all heard like the you know battery catching fire stories and all that kind of stuff but the glass is a new one for me so i don't know if anyone knows uh what i know on a bulb you know like going back a few years when i used to work on cars if you if you got the oils from your fingers on a certain type of bulb yeah. and even larger like street lamps and stuff like that um uh, sodium halide or something mm-hmm. like that. i know you could yeah. the bulb would blow out i i get that but um anyway you know, it was not overpowered by by any stretch of the imagination. It just exploded. So, very strange. Good You're still picking up pieces of, of glass or whatever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was finding little little bits everywhere. Hmm. A lot of the internal stress in that piece of uh, glass or mineral, whatever it was. <laughs> I doubt it was, like, sapphire. <laughs> no. I have a knife related thing I want to talk about if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> yeah, so Tops Knives finally released the, f- oh. <laughs> the first 50 pre-production uh what do they call it? The Brothers of Bushcraft knife, the folder. The folder, yeah. So that's 1095 steel, right? You have G10 handles and steel liners, right? Isn't that am I wrong? Nope. I think you can get micarta, but you can also get G10, something like that. You're, but you're is on the money. We- is it Westinghouse micarta? It is certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> Either way, they released the first 50. They're, this is a company that makes some really tough uh, outdoor 
higher end fixed blade knives and this is their first foray into folders when they've been uh, touting this this folder for the past what two two years at least at least two years um they've shown prototype after prototype at show after show but yet none of them have ever fallen into the hands of of the, you know of users um so they're trying to build up the hype around this thing and in the process um they're trying to sort of take a page out of zero tolerance's book and sort of build I, what would you say they're trying to do? They're they're trying to yeah, they're trying to generate interest, build generate hype, generate interest it. on on everything. So they're going to release the first fifth. They were going to release the first fifty uh, pre production models to the public, uh, built to production specifications. And you think about the materials that are going into this knife, and I, I mean it's an, it's a USA made product, so I'm happy about that. Um, but again, we're talking 1095 steel, G10 handles. And steel liners. The retail price that they're selling these these first fifty at is five hundred dollars. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we're going to get any sponsorship from Tops anytime soon. No. Hey, listen, I, I, I've never owned one of their knives. I'm sure they're nice, and, they're, I, and I actually was excited about this folder, but like I was for too. maybe for maybe. Two hundred and seventy-five dollars, yeah. or maybe three, maybe three, maybe three hundred reta- full, at full retail, right? But at five hundred, I think they're 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 going to be chasing their tails a little bit. I mean, I mean, I'm sure they've sold fifty all fifty of them now, but I remember six hours after, or or a, a good while after they had made the initial launch, fifty, you know, some of that first fifty were still available. Yeah. So, well, that's I have, I have three things here. One, tops folders have always been extraordinarily expensive and really fucking weird. Like everything they do, like tops is weird. They make a lot of weird, super mall ninja stuff, uh, but they also make some functional stuff. But generally, their prices are like kind of high for 1095 with some micarta. Mm-hmm. You don't see 1095 used in the in the folder world that often. No, because it's shitty. Edge I was under the impression that this was their first folder. No, they've they've made a few others that are really really bizarre stuff. Like really weird, really? yeah. Hmm. Um, what what else? Oh, uh, you know, they should have just had the good sense to cancel it, like Azula, like Essie did with the Azula folder that never came out. Oh yeah, does anyone remember? That was years for years. It was like that was like the holy grail, and then they were just like, no, it's not happening. They just gave up. I mean, how hard can it be? You know, like I feel like, you know, let's use Brian as an example. He's producing a knife in his garage, you know. And the the mini typhoon. What what was the retail price of that when it came out, Brian? It, it starts at four fifty. Yeah, I, I'm just saying. Yeah, that was S. That's S ninety V in a titanium frame lock. And made by one guy in a garage. And made with, by one yeah, guy in a garage. Made by hand, one at a time. Yeah, and I've and I've seen some fairly impressive. Um... Who can who can barely eat because he's doing at that price? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, who's working eighteen hours a day to survive? He's actually sitting on a bucket. It's much like the 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 Riot Factory. <laughs> <laughs> if, it ma- if it makes you feel better, they're probably selling way less of these knives than you've sold many typhoons. Yes, definitely. Without it's, a doubt. Yeah, it's such a weird to think of. Either way, it blew my mind, and I can't speak to the quality of the knife because I've never. I I probably will never have one cuz I don't think I could justify spending $500 on something like that on a bushcraft folder. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. For all the bushcraft that I do. Yes. Oh no, they're still That's... in stock by the way. <laughs> oh no way. Yeah, they're still in stock. So we are how many days we're recording this on the 24th. 24th. And when did it release? Last Friday? Something like that. <laughs> and they haven't sold 50 of them yet. Hmm. I mean, it's 500 fucking dollars. That's what you know what I mean. There's yeah. there's there's people out there that'll do it. There's an ass for every seat. Right? I, there's that I think is Top's motto. There's an ass for every seat, <laughs> and there is a hand for every mini axe with a two inch blade because they make the weirdest shit, man. <laughs> I remember when I was first getting into knives, two names stuck out as like, oh my god, you gotta have a Tops or you gotta have a Strider. Yep. <laughs> I, and I was uh, just like, wow, I wish I could own a Tops or a Strider. <laughs> And you've owned one and not the other. I wonder why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Weird, uh, weird mine, stuff, man. Mine, 
mine was GTC, and I'm still in the same boat. Yeah, well, that yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> we'll I, let that one slide, Jake. I put tops in the same co- uh, category as Extrema Ratio, the Italian company that makes mm. weird ass knives mean, for weird you ass mean people. Extrema Ratio. Yeah, Extrema Ratio. <laughs> they just who buys those? The same people that buy tops knives, I guess. I I know one guy on a on a. Oh, did you guys hear the thunder? Was that you just Ooh. moving like a rolling chair? No, dude. That's the actual thunder. Ah, <laughs> oh, fuck. We gotta get. We gotta hurry along. Yeah. Damn. Anyway, um, you know who? You know who uh, actually bought one of those? Uh, Ex Machiavelli. Uh, oh. The yeah. now from the now. I guess are they defunct? What's happening? Where's 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 our brothers in podcast? Uh, I don't know. Get. We'll just we'll just roll them into here. Then we'll have a completely unlistenable podcast oh, with six God, hosts. with six people. <laughs> that would be too, although I think with the Ferrum Forge guys, I thought we did a pretty good job. Yeah, it's it would be doable. Extraordinarily difficult. So Jake, Jake and I didn't talk. Darn yeah, that's true. Time. You guys didn't say a word. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it wouldn't be doable. No, it's not doable. Yeah. Scratch that. Sorry, guys. But yeah, yeah, Richard did buy one. The, I think it was the BF two. I don't know. Extreme Ratio makes weird knives. Like, there's just no appeal to them. The materials, like, nothing about it. The designs. I don't know. What's the Italian special forces is really keeping them in business? It never, it, it didn't, it, it blows my mind. What are they? If you go, go look at these knives and tell me if there's something that you would want to own. Th- there isn't. <laughs> listeners, listeners. Yes. Listeners, <laughs> not Dave. I can answer for you guys. It's no. <laughs> also, what do, you, what do you think the Italian special forces are doing? I mean, shout out to Italy. My mom's from Italy. Uh, but like, what kind of crises do you have in the like spaghetti shop that you need a folding, <laughs> like fixed blade, like the Extrema Ratio RAO? Like, like you've really got to cut that Neapolitan pizza, or it's like, oh no, this sorpresata, it's so strong, I need to get this ridiculous... For someone whose mother is from Italy, you clearly know nothing about that country. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. <laughs> she didn't take me there. It's not my fault. <laughs> she didn't take me there. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. Okay. That was pretty funny. Shout out to Italy. They do put ice cream on actual sandwich bread, though. Which is kind of weird. So, what are they going to use the the RAO yeah, to like to, scoop it, it out because it looks like exactly, a shovel? Exactly, because it looks like a shovel. Yeah, you can use that to spread your your gelato onto a roll and eat it like a freaking sandwich. Their go. ice cream sandwich actually means ice cream fucking sandwich. That's gross. Isn't that weird? Shout out to Italy. <laughs> you actually want to try it though, don't you? Actually, you know what? I really should yeah, apologize to Italian don't. people since I slandered Lion Steel so hard. You ooh, really did. Ooh, one last thing before we go into our main topic. Uh, does anyone know the YouTube channel Advanced Knife Bro? He, he's got... Dude, shut up. Look, you know I love the Advanced <laughs> yeah. Knife Bro. Did you bro. see the SR11 lock <laughs> failing miserably? Get the hell out of here. <laughs> dude, shut up. You know I love the Advanced he Knife is, Bro. That dude, I love that guy. Yeah, his, his yeah, knife this, reviews are transcendent. Man, man crush of the I year. I am completely okay with that. They are transcendently weird. Dude. His 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 reviews but yeah did you see the I, sr11 fail i did i did i did see that it was, fail. I, you know i, I literally ejaculated as soon as i saw that lock fail <laughs> <laughs> full body orgasm i had to lay down afterwards some you know what dude i love you but some you you genuinely disgust me sometimes it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know who genuinely disgusts me the blade voting committee when they give people bullshit I'm, awards. I did, uh, you know, I used I used to do files uh, for school on uh, serial killers who got off, who, who could only ejaculate. Oh yeah, yeah, the really guy in Russia. Weird, sadistic. Yes, Andre Chikatilo is the one I'm thinking of. But uh, <laughs> oh my Dave, god, on the, you have don't that. you love you that? It's that on the for, his uh, name is on the tip of Dave's tongue at all times. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that so that's really it's someone else's failure. Is what really gets Dave off. That's going that the show says notes. a lot about his character. If I'm if I'm profiling him. No, I love. So. Uh, you know, I just you know, I've got I've got problems. I got a beef with Lion Steel. They can patch it up though if they give that award back. <laughs> they give it back. They're gonna have to bring it to you yeah. personally, and I'm gonna smash it in front of them, along with some super sod and a and a rayo to cut it with. Yes. Before we get on to Move some on. more dull topics, um. There was a, a video that um, Epic Snuggle Bunny posted um, about another Italian brand uh, that I thought was really cool. Um, Dave, I need your help with this one. Is it a knife company? 
It's a knife company. And it was a Dama steel blade. Oh, the fox knives. Yes. Yeah, fox. It was that fox, um, the desert fox. I have fox. to say, I love the look of that knife. Yeah, the, the really embellished ones with the Dama steel blades are Beautiful. super nice. Yeah, those are really cool. Yeah. They're not I cheap, kinda, though. If, I kind of want guess. one. But, but you know what? I looked up the price of it. I think it was like 700 bucks. Yeah. And then, and then you think about the price of that, of that tops folder for 500 <laughs> It's a good deal. And, <laughs> and you question reality. <laughs> yeah. Right, we can talk about boring stuff now. I just wanted to point that. What was that knife called? It's a fox knife. It's a desert dog. fox. Desert fox. Go look that thing up. Go on uh, Epic Snuggle Bunnies, uh, either his YouTube or his uh, Instagram. And check that thing out. Yeah, that they have like a very gorgeous. tactical one that's black G10 and a liner lock, but then they have the super embellished titanium frame lock. Ain't yeah, nobody got I'm time looking, for that. Yeah. I'm looking at the embellished one and uh, – <clears throat> I thought for a second that maybe it was not the same Italian fox company that makes the plastic handled, uh, you know, knives that you always see everywhere. But apparently, yeah, the plastic Spyderco ripoffs. Yeah. That's yeah. They also they, do that. They say it was in the same kind of Spyderco category. They also do wow. that Warren Cliffy Torzola with the wooden handles too. Yeah, they do a bunch of different mm -hmm. versions of that Torzola oh, I knife. I, I knew that was I, coming. I did get a, <laughs> I did get a Warren Cliff, by the way. Uh, love on. I, oh, we, you did. We briefly talked about it. Yeah, I just uh, I just got one, and that's all there is to. Jake had more spider coats that we didn't mention. Yeah, more probably more spider coats that are going to end up heading uh, over to Great Britchard. across the pond. Yeah, <laughs> Great so, Britchard. <laughs> that's yeah. I don't know what else to call it anymore. It's getting boring talking about that country all the time. But and then he ordered another knife today. Uh, We're very happy for what. him. Uh, yeah, he st he still doesn't have that one because we got to fill the box first. That's the whole point of all this. Is it costs the same amount to send one knife as it does to send a whole bunch of knives because international shipping is crazy expensive. So. In America, yeah, it's fucking terrible. Just how yeah, expensive just get it is them all together and ship them at once. Yeah, and I'm, and I usually do something to them while they're here. So anyway, neato. Moving along. Speaking of speaking of segueing into. Uh, Knife maintenance and things of that nature, sharpening. Ooh. Would someone like to segue into this? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were about to do it. Congratulations, that was the worst segue. That was a terrible segue, segue, Jake. You're off segue duty. <laughs> See, I, didn't, I don't have the word. I, I just knew what the topic was. I don't have the words to do the segue. <laughs> but you sounded like you sounded like you really had the words to do the segue, as though if I had done it, I'd be taking something away from. No, me. Levon's the segue guy. Yeah. I thought you were gonna just you were gonna jump on top of me and be like, "Yes, this week." Nope. nope. No, no. It's all right though. So, to, on y'all want to talk about? We're gonna be stuff? talking about lubricants and lubricants. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa! I'm just gonna stop recording right. now. <laughs> yeah, just hit stop. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about knife maintenance this week. A sort of dry yeah. topic. Which is funny because I reached my last post on Instagram. I asked, like, hey guys, what do you guys want us to talk about today on as we record tonight? But Dave already had a whole thing planned out. So yes. we'll get to <laughs> we'll get to your suggestions, which were awesome, by the way. This has been an, like, an extraordinarily unstructured 40 minutes. So it's a good thing the rest of it will be very rigidly structured. Exactly. You guys can, can tune out now if you want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I guess. If we're going to do maintenance, we should start small. Lubricants. So, and lubricants. And, and lubricants. So if you have a folding knife, it has a pivot, and uh, pivots occasionally need to be lubricated. So, Basically, before we, let's, let's start by saying, like, if you own a lot of knives, your knives are going to either sit there or get used. And either way, you're going to have to try and take care of them at some point. Because... For a lot of us, they're not small investments. You know, for a lot of us in the community, we have knives that cost a lot or cost a little. But either way, it's a tool that we want to, to perform. So you've got to keep them clean and or, you know, lubricated. <laughs> or Sharp. else. Or else. <laughs> or else it won't work. Why don't we just run through, what does everyone use for lubricant? I use... Uh... Daiwa Real Oil because it is cheap mm -hmm. and it works pretty decently. Because... Did you just say diarrhea oil? Yes. <laughs> oh, concentrate... That's what mineral oil is. Well, yeah, I got a lot of that. Yeah, mineral oil, that's exactly what mineral oil will do. When people use mineral oil to lubricate their knives, you cut food with that, 
it's gonna be diarrhea oil but anyway no it, and it is it is a uh, sold in the diarrhea aisle yes the store that is true no daiwa <laughs> d-a-i-w-a it is a japanese company i want to say and it's for uh lubricating fishing reels so it's just it's pretty thin and it works it's like eight dollars because i've tried a lot of other lubricants and i tend to err on the side of it all being bullshit <laughs> so what do you guys use I use whatever Jake puts in most of my knives. Well, that's easy. That is true. Jake, what do you use? I'm gonna, Brian. I'm gonna let Brian go because mine will probably be long and boring. Because I I use ten different things for ten different purposes. Yeah, I kind of you know my feeling about it is once the knife is kind of at least mine once they're broken it doesn't matter too much. Um, you know, after like just regular maintenance on them, you can just drop a pretty much a drip of any kind of oil in there is going to do what you need to do. Wait, are you telling me um, I, I don't need nanoparticles, like nanorobots, to lubricate the pivot on my extremely simple machine? Do those the, look like the scrubbing bubbles? <laughs> yeah. You know, the distance that this bit, that these bearings travel and the surfaces that they're on, it's, it's all bullshit. I mean, to, it is. It's, um, it's snake oil. Even, I even think with the, you know, Let's the ceramic you bearings, you know, all, it's all crap. It, it, this stuff is like under no load. It's, it's, you don't need something major. You know, my concern, what happens to me, basically everybody comes to me, like my customers and ask me, what do I do? How do I, what, what do I change it with? You know, cause what I do is I put grease, I pack the bearings with grease and then I also use an oil. Now what I, what basically happens is the grease gets pushed out of the way a little bit and it kind of makes just a little barrier for sand and any, little hard shit to get caught on. And that's the reason I do that. Um, but I don't recommend that people take the knives apart to, to repack them with grease. I, I, you know, all my knives that I use, I basically just blow out with air and put a drop of oil back in them. That's I was going to say, like, one of the top mm -hmm. things you want to have is some compressed air, right? For any yeah, sort it, of... It can even be... You can even use, like, a brake cleaner or, you know, contact cleaner or something. Just some whatever to blast the shit out. Anything then, you yeah. put on your food, basically. <laughs> well, I guess you're going to use it for food. You know, my hands are in brake break cleaner and shit all the time anyway. That's the, the least of my problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I worked in the printing industry, but I've eaten blue sandwiches because my hands were just like filled with ink and I, you know, you don't have time to stop. I've literally eaten blue sandwiches. Oh, How about blue that waffles? Worse? How many blue are, waffles? Are, is that then? worse than blue waffles or not as bad? <laughs> I just want a whole episode where we learn about the printing industry. Yeah. That's our other podcast. We had that a long time ago. Yeah, that's it was one pretty of cool. Other, it, it's, it's, book, it's, it's called Bookcast. <laughs> that's pretty much where I cut my teeth and everything. But I was doing a whole lot more then than I've done in a long time. You know, because I was um, doing PLC work and writing PLC programs, and you're working on you know million dollar machines that have to put a dot in the same spot. You know, on a piece of paper that's going you know two thousand feet a minute. Okay. It's uh, it's pretty amazing stuff, and the tolerances that are there. It's it's uh. Yeah, that stuff probably needs like an actually good lubricant, and uh, might actually need like <laughs> nano robots or whatever. Matter. Yeah, they you, you know you have to filter the oil as it goes, you know, as the sumps um are pumping oil through them and everything, because all that shit just uh, their gearboxes need to be so precise. So the opposite of knives. <laughs> I can't stop picturing yeah. the scrubbing bubbles. That's that's what nano oil is. Go on the website. They have a little picture of the little scrubbing bubbles, like you know, making your knife smoother. Mm. Hype. I'm not saying that stuff doesn't work. I just I'm sure know. it does. It's oil. I just don't know. Like, does it really do anything that special? It's just strange that it's being marketed uh, in this conversation for the type of object that doesn't really benefit from it. Mm. Yep. I, I think that's really where where all yes. the negativity is you know focused around that particular product I, I just read nothing but hate about it these days uh in the knife community but if you go to a different type of uh piece of machinery or just a different object it might actually be very useful and work much better than traditional or conventional oils so uh, it's really just a matter of application well even I like think but i i have i haven't really uh even more complex things that particular one. like clocks don't even need sure. that fancy of an oil. Like my dad is a mm. antiquarian horologist. Yeah. Shout out to my horology people. And he just you never uses... told me that. Yeah. Wow. Um, and 
it like he doesn't use fucking nano robot oil just you know yeah. very regular oil i would think yeah so I, the way i picture it being used is in manufacturing where the way they use delrin where there's something that's going to be repeated a billion times and you know the two surfaces that are contacting each other need to have certain wear properties and you know not heating up and all that kind of stuff if for some reason you can't have a plastic in there it might be beneficial to have a trillion tiny little ball bearings or something like that but again because our focus is knives i'm just going to leave it as i don't know why we would need that <laughs> um and you know even phosphor bronze washers are so soft that again if you had tiny little balls in there they would just get pressed into the pb so <laughs> mm. i don't know where it really uh shines I, I um but it maybe it's not with knives maybe it's fantastic elsewhere and that's that's all i have to say about that yeah um for me i use uh, a, a wide array of lubricants on knives um Thank you even for relatively similar knives and uh yeah <laughs> uh there's some carryover between the bedroom and knives because some of those things that we like to be food safe like edci uh, mineral oil, coconut oil are also great in the bedroom. Wait, um, but can I can I can I interject real quick? Sure. Aegis Knife Care Solutions are they gone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that seems like a, a relevant thing to bring up here. I have no idea. Let's see if the website's if the uh -huh. let's see if the website's my, back. My favorite knife cleaning slash knife preservation uh, solutions solutions. Yeah. <laughs> um. The company uh, seems to be no yep. longer there. Yep, the website's still down. Well, that's yeah. mm -hmm. So get, been... get, get that new old stock at like Blade HQ where they still have it. Yeah, we should have been more more uh, stingy with how I'm going to order that right that's now. All, everything. Oh, they still have the big all ass bottles everything. at Blade HQ for fifteen bucks. For those I'm not order all that now. For those not familiar, Aegis Solutions was a company that made this thing called the HDCI formula, and it was basically. And yeah, and EDCI. It was a dry lubricant that also prevented rust. You just mm, sprayed it negative on. Negative on the dry. There, Is it? It wasn't oh, it's dry. air dry. It was, no. Yeah, it was liquid. And then there, it dried. The, yeah. the HDCI was, was one that smelled like curry that you were supposed to let air dry, and it did indeed work. It was a very, um, you know, successful barrier against, uh, you know, corrosion and stuff like that. Um, it, for something that was just going to sit, or even something you were going to use, but like a big fixed blade where... Um, where you would want something to just kind of dry on there. I used, I would take uh, the charging handles of, uh, you know, OTF like halos, uh, you know, Microtech halo. And I would, you know, spray that uh, even on AR-15, same, same concept. Um, and then the other product, the green one is the EDCI. And that was the food safe one that was just kind of a daily, you know, wipe down, uh, spray down and wipe off. Um, and we use that, you know, daily for the last couple of years. And actually this is the first I'm hearing that they're defunct. So that stinks. Yeah. yeah. So there are, there are other food safe options, but, um, that one was the only one that, you know, was specifically for knives, uh, in that, you know, category. So that stinks. And I like the little spray bottles. They had a little lock on them. So, you, so it wouldn't dump out in Levon's bag, like every other liquid. <laughs> Or turn on like what the was flashlights, that hops, like hops number nine dumped out in your trunk one time. Oh yeah, <laughs> your that whole definitely. car smelled like a gun shop. <laughs> it did. Yeah. What was the, that? Was the uh, the Challenger? Yeah. The Challenger. Yeah. There was mm -hmm. no getting. There's no getting rid of the hops number nine smell. It's better than the smell of Tough Glide. Tough Glide has a very distinct smell, and I, I find uh, it yeah. very unpleasant. So uh, I, I want to let me get through my uh, theory really fast because it's really boring. So. Uh, uh, let's go. Let's go from most frequent to least frequent. Um, I use a different lube for the track where the detent ball rides um, than I would use on, say, a pivot or bearings or whatever. Um, I found years ago that most, especially a thin lube, but even a thicker, like a grease, just gets pushed out of the way because the nature of that interface is you have a flat surface on one side and a very small area of contact from that detent ball and therefore it's really efficient at just kind of cutting through the grease and pushing it out of the way so you get like three smooth flips or whatever and then and then it's over um my background before i was a whatever i am now a douchebag uh was in the automotive industry and uh 
engine assembly oil was just something that I came to believe in because uh, it was unbelievably important on a five or $10,000 engine build that um, the initial break-in oil did its job while that, that first time the engine was being turned over, you know, the oil pump was doing absolutely nothing for up to like 30 seconds. So the oil that I carried over from that industry uh, is, uh, you know, engine assembly lube, which is kind of like halfway between an oil and a grease. It, it, it's either like a light grease or a heavy oil. Um, I only use that on the detent track because you, you'll find something funny happens if you put it on the pivot like on, the, you know, bronze phosphor, uh, bronze phosphor washers. Uh, it turns the knife into like a hydraulic arm, basically. So, you know, it won't flick anymore because it's so uh, thick and sticky. But it does its job on the detent track. Uh, as for bearings, I go very light, if at all, on the grease and, um, uh, washers. I, again, something super light to keep it moving or a little heavier. If it's, uh, the type of knife, like a heavy duty knife or one I don't use that often. And I just want it to stick around for a long time. The, the only other thing that's weird that I wanted to mention is, um, a lot of knives have more than average clearance between the the pivot itself and the hole in the blade where, where the pivot um, lives. And, and I find that using a super, super, it's, it's not enough surface area that the viscosity of your lube is going to make a big difference in the action because, you know, that that's basically going to happen with, within the interface and, and washer or, or bearing, um, or I'm sorry, blade and bearing interface. On the pivot itself, if you have uh enough clearance or too much clearance which many knives do you can feel you know as it say it's halfway open uh or when you're just assembling disassembling you can tell that there's some clearance there i like to fill that void with a really uh hardy heavy duty kind of lube that will stick again going back to the engine lube or even like a synthetic grease that's uh like a marine type grease or something for trailer hitches or something like that something that'll help fill that gap because while there does need to be some kind of a gap, otherwise there you would know, be stuff that just everybody has. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you have a lot of hobbies, you have everything from really, really light up to uh, really heavy um, lubricant. So I don't know if you want to take anything away from that spiel, just don't use WD-40. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, like, like Brian said, the, the other thing that people uh, seem to universally neglect is if you're going to go as so far as to take your knife apart to clean it and then re-lubricate it uh don't forget to actually do the cleaning part i see a lot of people uh putting their knives back together with gunk in you know like on the lock face um you know that that hard to clean area where the lock bar interfaces on the lock face of the blade um, i'll open that stick a piece of paper in there and close it and then, you know, kind of move the paper and close it again and, and do that a thousand times until the paper comes out clean. Um, you know, I, I always buy uh, re up on wooden Q tips because they're more rigid and you can really get in there and uh, ah. get the gunk out of the way. Recently, I started, I went as far as just straight up purchasing syringes to sneak a little bit of grease onto that detent track on knives where the track is not visible. Um, but Brian mentioned uh, using. Uh, so a harsh abrasive type chemical like brake clean or um, uh, electrical like contact cleaner, which I think is really overlooked. Uh, you know, again, if you're going to take the time to take the whole thing apart and, you know, re lube it, I think you should start with a nice clean slate before you lube it, you know, before you put it back together. And you do kind of need something that harsh um, for these types of surfaces that have just had grease on them for their whole lives basically the pores are going to get all caught up with stuff and um what sort of the last uh, just last thing i wanted okay. to mention is just make especially if i mean whether you're we're mostly dealing with titanium frame locks whether they have a steel insert or not please make sure there's no grease or lube or or wd-40 or uh bodily fluids or whatever where that lock interfaces uh, because if it's titanium on steel, it'll make it sticky. And if it's uh, steel on steel, it'll make it slippery. And you may potentially cut your finger off like someone I know did. Um, yeah, sorry. I, I, that was a just kind of uh, on a ramble there. What, what were you trying to say, Lava? I, I was just going to ask what sort of hermetically sealed chamber 
you use to disassemble your knives because I can see you doing that right now. And I and, and I, everyone at home is thinking, wow. Yeah, it's like a it's like a bubble boy situation. Yeah, here. definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you bring the knives to me. Mm-hmm. I don't go to the knives because I have a I have to stay Correct. in this bubble. I, I wish um, I had that kind of patience. And but I, I always just rush things when I'm like disassembling knives and it's a bad habit. That's kind of part two of my spiel. Oh God! <laughs> which is which is only one sentence. Uh, all of that is assuming that this is part of like a hobby. If you just want the, to like get the thing sharp, get it clean, and get it back out there, then there's a different set of advice altogether that we can get to. Yeah. Maybe maybe we In should get to section. that. <laughs> all right. Well, then use WD forty and go get a new uh, hobby. <laughs> That's what I, I like. To tell you. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> Yeah, send but... it to send it to someone who does uh, maintenance and tuning and sharpening, um, or just yeah, there are easier ways to do it if if it's really not fun for you. That, like you know, I talk, talk to people about RC stuff. Like they they only want to drive it or fly it. They don't want to work on it. And then there's the polar opposite where you know people enjoy the building part so much more. So that they just turn into models and they just kind of sit there forever. Um, you know, I. I'm somewhere in between. So um, it, what Brian said about not disassembling your knife is a very, very good piece of advice. Yep. If you're not interested in taking it to the, you know, hobby level where you understand what you're doing, you're probably going to do more damage than good. Uh, and if that's the case, compressed air, like we said, is your absolute best friend. Um, find a, you know, a, a lube that's kind of in, in between. And that's where I really liked the EDCI because you can get it all over the knife and it won't hurt anything so we're gonna have to find a new product to recommend that that kind of fills that or we just buy all the stock that file yeah file the remaining stock and then then mark it up and then resell it and yeah mark it way up knife nut solution i mean yeah (laughs) um all all the ball sweat i just take business cards i mean index cards right with a with a crayon on there knife nut solution and start rebranding reselling it through instagram it's, it's it's knife nuts branded ball sweat ball sweat yes that's in the paintball industry that's uh someone was smart enough to just buy five gallons of dow 40 which is like a really common industrial lube they they added a dye to it and sold it as hater sauce i think it was for oh i remember a that hundred thousand times the price like <laughs> a tiny that. little scoop of the stuff is like twenty dollars <laughs> You could buy like a jug for that for that price. So uh, maybe that's what we'll do when we find uh, a good all-purpose knife lubricant again. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, just blow it out and whatever. Um, I don't know. It's 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 hard for me to, to recommend uh, on on that end of things because I love uh, you know sort of uh, getting inside and getting things pregnant. Um, I'm, I'm the exact opposite. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, you tell me what you like and what you don't like, and and maybe we can go. No, I just I don't enjoy disassembling, so I don't use grease because mm-hmm. I have fluorinated grease, which I use occasionally on like uh, Chris Reeve knives since they're so easy to take the blade out. But I just generally mm-hmm. just use oil because I don't want to disassemble knives that I don't have to, especially just to add lube. So that's why I generally am an oil only guy. And that Chris Reeves are knives are one of the few that are intended to be. Uh, taken apart because when you go to reassemble the knife you, you know it's not sensitive to the amount of pressure the the amount of torque that you're putting on those screws you know yep. the, the the purpose of that bushing and the tolerance put on that bushing is so that you can just kind of crank it down or half crank it down and it'll still function the the knife the word tuning that i use when i talk about reassembling a lot of these knives is really an accurate word because they're so incredibly sensitive to how much torque you apply um, yeah, on, on the hardware. And th- again, that, yeah, for that reason, I'll, I'll, I'll concede that much in that if you really don't know what you're doing, um, then you'll probably do more harm than good. So for those knives um, or for those collectors, there's nothing wrong with just blowing it out with compressed air uh, and, and putting a drop of lube in the pivot area, which is what most manufacturers recommend anyway and what Brian recommends. There's nothing wrong with that. Yep. that method um but uh, you know again it's it all depends on the end user some some people listening to this podcast have three knives or five knives or two knives and some have like 160 knives and 
you know, if you if you have a huge collection and you live in a humid area, you're going to have to at least coat the blades. You know, even a you know steel that's technically stainless, but it's sort of on on the verge, um, like S30 and you know steels like that. You will still eventually you'll see them start to develop some kind of Correct. oxidation. And I know sure. I know yeah I know people get all up in arms about that stuff. So um, if nothing else. You know, stop the blade from rusting if that's going to keep you up at night. But um, I can't tell you how many knives I've opened up that either that were mine or other people's knives, and the the bearings themselves had big chunks of rust basically floating around in there. Um, and you know, from the knife getting wet at some point, and then not having enough lube to um, to sort of ward off that um, the corrosion that comes from from the I don't know, salt water, maybe whatever, whatever it was, but that that's a case where WD-40 actually would come in handy, believe it or not, because it would displace the water um, before you kind of blow it out and relube it. So, so if, if you guys didn't want to deal with any of this stuff, Jake, can can customers or not really customers, can people send you their knives to get tuned to your specifications? Of At that course, point, they would be customers, but you know what I mean. Because why waste this obsession that, that everyone says I have? Um, Good sure, point. why not? Truth. <laughs> all right. M- moving on to the second part. Can I just send you all my knives to put together? <laughs> there you there you go. No, that's what your kids are for. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like Riyadh's factory. <sighs> it's it's too bad. Sorry, we, we waste Dang. so much t- money on too. shipping. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> so, as much as I hate disassembling, sometimes you do have to adjust knives, so... Disassembly tools or just, you know, wrenches. I think the, the major ones you should have are Torx because that is predominantly what you see and then hex. And I think the solution that we'll all agree on is Weha. I don't even know like what else. Get Weha. Don't buy the junk from Home Depot and Lowe's like Husky. They're, they're, the tolerances are awful and they will strip out and they'll probably strip your screws. So just spend the money. It's a great investment. Get the Weha Torx. Devon's made into Germany, yeah. They Did are you... made in Malaysia now as well, I think. Oh. Did you guys see um, Knife News posted um, something about We Knives um, patent their star-shaped screws or yeah. some shit like that? Yeah, they're, they're, they're proprietary ones. That as if like anyone else course. wanted to use them. Yeah. Yeah. And I like that they even they said they they got a patent in China too. Like that makes a fucking difference. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Wow, that's crazy. So they're basically just reverse <laughs> Torx. So I think they're just a worse design than Torx. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. The, well, the the saying there is "buy once, cry once." Yes. Some things are worth experimenting with cheap alternatives. Tools are not. Yeah. Especially when it comes to these really small, precise bits of machinery or, or uh, hardware. Yeah. Just 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 buy a good set of tools, and then you won't I, have to I, buy them again. I, I and tell you won't you have what, to though, contact Brian. <laughs> I've I've tried all every brand out there of Torx drivers. And the amount of screws that I put in and out, I sure. still shatter them. No matter what brand it is, eventually they just give up on Yeah, I had two sure. Weha break in a row, actually. So I guess we should say that they're not invincible. Even though they're yeah, better well, the quality, others, they're not invincible. My other Torx saying is when you think it's the right size, it's actually the next one up. Yep. If you guys remember that one from an earlier episode. And I, and I dare you, even guys who have been doing this for a while and you think this doesn't apply to you, I dare you. <laughs> um, you think you you have a routine or whatever? Just try the next size up, and there's a I don't know 50 50 chance you're going to find holy crap, he was right. It actually was the next size up, and that's yes. where a lot of people get in trouble with uh, stripping. Even because yep. uh, people will say to me, "I got the good, I got Weira or we or one of the good ones," and I still stripped it, and that's usually why. He's what I found though is specific. it's I think that's more the screw manufacturer than um, could be is just making a loose tolerance because you know I've looked at screws and looked at the call outs and it's calling for the smaller size even you know it's calling for an eight even though the nine fits in perfect the, mm-hmm. yeah the, and the nine is really tight and, and will not strip it, right um, Spiderco I've, I've seen a, a variance across different um, origin like manufacturer origins like there's the tai, tai chung uh colorado you know 
I've even seen differences there where, again, like you said, it'll call for an eight, but the nine is actually uh, the one you want to use if it's got th- red thread locker on it and you're going to really, you know, yeah, go to, red... go to town on it or something. Thread locker is another thing uh, to mention. So lock sure. tight, I guess, is the big company. I don't know who else makes it, but they basically pound mm-hmm. that. There's three colors. Red is permanent. Don't ever use it. Unless it's something that really needs to be fixed in place. Just don't do it, though. You're going to fuck it up. Just don't use it. Uh, blue is the one that everyone commonly uses. That's the removable one. But purple, I think, is my favorite. Although it's really expensive in comparison to red or blue. And purple is like blue but lower strength. So it is removable. But it is even lower strength. So it Because blue Loctite can get pretty cured in there. It can be kind of hard to remove sometimes. Um, so I like purple Loctite a lot, but it's really expensive. Like, it's like 15 or color... $20 for a small bottle of it festively colored thing that you actually like yeah. maybe they ought to manufacture a gray loctite for you i would love a gray loctite if it was Ooh. one that like you know you didn't have to heat the knife up to 300 degrees or something or like put a crazy amount of force into it to you could just use out. one of our flashlights <laughs> seriously I also have that actually would do the trick have, mm-hmm. have either of you guys used vibratite before it's another uh, so what, what i was going to say is i'm i'm unhappy with all three of your color choices yes and, i don't uh, love them either I use, I almost exclusively use VC5 uh, Vibratite these days. Oh, I have VC3. Um, is this the wrong one? Or is it VC3? Yeah. Whatever. The red I one. use Vibratite. And uh, kind of harkening back to um, uh, my other rant from earlier, you have to clean the parts first. And this goes for thread locker. This goes for Vibratite. This really goes for almost anything. Most of these knives are not being manufactured to with the kind of care that uh, custom <laughs> knife like Brian's. Um, a lot of this hardware has oil and stuff left over from the manufacturing process. If you want your Loctite to work, you're going to have to use at least alcohol or preferably, if you can, something like acetone, brake clean, um, you know, contact cleaner, etc. before you apply that, that Loctite. Otherwise, it's just like spray painting something where, mm-hmm. you know, if you don't clean it first, you're actually just spraying the dust on the surface. Um, if there, if your threads are really well oiled and you add Loctite, chances are, you know, the Loctite is not going to cure and do its job. So if you just clean the threads first, blue will usually do its job. I find that the way we use our pivots in that they are kind of tuned and sometimes it'll break in and you might have to go back and just give it a tiny, tiny bit of a turn, you know, tighter or looser, depending on, on the knife and the situation. Um, Vibratite's whole purpose in life, if used properly, is just that it, it's, it doesn't break free when you turn it, like the blue, uh, well, like any other thread locker. Um, thread locker is kind of on off. Vibratite is, uh, as the name suggests, it's really just meant to a- avoid uh, a piece of hardware from turning under heavy vibration. Uh, and on a knife application, it works really well because you can tweak it a little bit and it's and it maintains that sticky sort of nature. But I do want to know what Brian uses because it seems to work really well. The problem of the fir- with the Vibratite, the problem I have that with it first off is I can never get it on the, these fine, small threads thin enough. Where oh, yeah, it's a really I, weird, you know, it's like I'll get it the first product. time after I, you know, the second time I use the same package, it's, it's done. You know, it's mm-hmm. like I can't get it thin enough to... Right. To for to, you know, for the threads to plow through it. Um, right. I use. Well, it's funny because this this last batch I started. So many people are coming back to me say, for some reason they're taking their knives apart and they're taking their lock insert off and I used to, um, lock tight the. Um, <laughs> I can't even fucking talk anyway. I um used to lock tight the screws for the lock insert. Right. And because I, I didn't want that to move, you know, that's obviously a critical sure. part that, that has my detent, that, you know, involved in there and it has your, your, your lock up in there. So you, I didn't want that to move. So I did that. And then, so, you know, I constantly got called. Oh, I broke the little screws because they're only two fifty sixes. So this this last round of the mini typhoons, I, I didn't do any Loctite on the inserts. See what happens. I don't know. What do you guys like? for that kind of stuff anyway. What do you like to see Loctited? Do you like to see all the screws Loctited? Or do you just like the pivot? 
Not necessarily, but well, first off, what do you use on the pivot? Because I've um, noticed that it has the kind of the, properties that I like, and I don't yeah, know what I'm, you're putting on there. For the for the pivot, I'm using um, Scotch Weld. It's the three M okay. product. Yeah, it's yeah, purple yeah, yeah, yeah. TL twenty two. Yep, that is the other. One. That's the, one of the few that I have not tried yet, but I've heard great things from people like yourself, apparently. Um, yeah, and that's sort of like a, a vibratite on steroids. And uh, from what you're saying, I guess it's thinner, so it's a little easier to apply. Um, but it does seem to work really well. But in, in other hobbies, we used to use uh, nail polish for this application. I don't know if right. you've yeah, ever tried that, that before. Um, and it was neat. It, it sort of had uh, – it was kind of in the middle. And it's a great – if you're in a bind and you don't have any of these products you and you can just grab some nail polish, it, it will kind of uh, – it's not perfect, obviously, but it's kind of half like a Loctite and half like a Vibratite, and it stays kind of sticky. And Brian um, does have a, a vast collection of nail polish. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at a box. I have it on my workbench. What because, color is uh, it? Especially uh, this one is like a ruby red. No, it's got to have a funny name. Is one thing the, that I'm, I've um, learned about the nail polish. Hold on, hold on, I'm getting. I'm, I, getting I'm guessing it's, I'm not a waitress. Pure ice, super something. I can't tell because it's uh, the label is screwed up, but uh, Pure Ice is the brand. So anyway, if you're going into plastic, it, it applies more than, than, you know, metal, but whatever. It's called Superstar. Anyway, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Continue. Have, have, have you used Teflon tape before? I've tried it and I haven't had any good results with it. Teflon is, um, isn't really a sealant it's a, it's, or anything like that. It's a lubricant. You know, so you're putting if you put Teflon on threads, um, that's going to lubricate the threads and allow it to move easier. Oh, it, 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 takes up, it takes up some space. So it feels it might feel it, like it, it'll it's tighter, feel tighter. It's really yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, and again, I think that's more for see, we use that again when you scale up from knives to automobiles and you're using much bigger hardware yeah it can sort of have the opposite effect the neat thing it does is it's almost like an anti-seize where if there if if there's too much play in the first place then you just throw more uh you know throw more teflon tape on it and it will come out two or three years from now whereas if you just tighten the hell out of it it might you know rust its way in there but um yeah i think i think for most knife applications it's probably the scale is just wrong. You know, the, the tape itself is too thick and, and it's not going to do what you need it to do. But if anyone has good luck with it, uh, I'd love to hear about that. You, you know, the scene Whatever. from I'll breaking watch. bad where Jesse yells, yeah, bitch science. That's what I just feel like happened to me. <laughs> mm. Nice. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just woke up. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Okay. you know what? Someone was asking me, uh, well, someone asked, uh, in the last post that I had on Instagram, like, what are you getting when you buy a custom knife versus a production knife? And it's this level of conversation. <laughs> people, you know, have to like, well, at least this. at least you're getting someone that cares, thinks about at this, this level, yeah, as opposed to just get as many units out as quick as possible and make make bottom dollar, make big bottom dollar. <laughs> um, I think that there's something to be said for that level of you know care or nerdism about about the topic no i no? agree i agree seriously <laughs> it's like i would want my doctor if i was having surgery to kind of geek out on his scalpel and his loop and his uh, uh beautiful assistant and all of those things <laughs> um i don't know i want my knife my knife makers and my knife people sharpeners whatever to be uh to be nerdy about the topic is, is, that, is a custom knife going to be you know perform that much better than a 30 dollar knife it's gonna probably perform not. better it, it, it should perform better right. but it's all relative i mean a thousand dollars compared to 30 dollars is it you know is it that much better no it's that's not what it's about you know it's just no. like everything in the world guns cars you know you can some people are with good enough i'm good enough driving my hyundai to go back and forth to work you don't Where drive any. You don't drive anywhere, dude. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I hate fucking driving. Um, you know, or somebody will have a Corvette. Do you need your Corvette to do that? No. But what? what if you can afford it and uh, it makes you feel good? Fuck it. Fuck it, indeed. There, there's it, thresholds, kind of like we were talking about earlier, with 
you know, whether your motivation lies more on one type of uh, EDC object than another, or, you know, whether your car matters more than your house. And it, you know, you can scale that out to every aspect of life, but we're doing this because we appreciate the, the extra work and the extra thought. Um, oh, and you, I could argue, I, th- I think the threshold for knives, you know, 150 bucks, Brian, yeah, Brian mentioned 30 versus custom. And since we're talking about custom, we'll just say anything in like 500 to $1,500 range. I think there is a threshold where somewhere in that sort of ZT ish, $150 range, like Levon just said, there, there is kind of, um, a diminishing returns after that point. Yeah. If you're just strictly talking about the functionality performance, yeah. you know, it may not be artistic and it may, may not be, um, whatever, like, a things know, like carbon a fiber thing. versus my Carta are not going to keep you up at night. Right. <laughs> but there's certainly a big, big difference between, uh, you know, so we said there's not a huge difference functionally between, between maybe a ZT and a custom, but there's a huge difference functionally between a fifteen dollar um, eight CR thirteen MOV knife and that hundred and fifty dollar, you know, M M three ninety or S thirty five or whatever. That genuinely there is a big difference, and and actually I find myself uh, because of the circles that we all sort of uh, socialize in, I find myself explaining that difference pretty frequently, and I think for the most part, uh, it makes sense. I think it's some sure. of it's kind of obvious, I mean. yeah. but that is right now. And I think that that could change. Um, but at least for right now, um, I think that's where that threshold lies from, from what I've read from the, uh, guys who have been collecting much longer than we have on place like, like blade forums, that threshold did used to be lower for customs. Sure. Um, but you know, knives are very popular right now and, uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what, what happens in the future. I mean that. Uh, I mean, I, I hate to talk about it more because it's everyone and their mom seems to be getting one. But that uh, that real steel megalodon, that the updated twenty fifteen, yeah. that thing is unreal for for what you pay for it. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, but then here's the funny thing: is now that you you can't find one. Yeah, as I say, now they're all they're all disappearing. So yeah, maybe it was a little too late. Yeah, well, like when it's Spider Co. It was Spider Co. Blew out that K two. It, it with the huge 10v titanium um, folder for great like story about that bucks. knife and now you can't get them for 100 bucks anymore yeah so some yeah sometimes there's things that kind of break the break the threshold a little bit but but i, I you know again if, if that's our that's the point we're getting to um it you know it'll it'll normalize and it'll it'll all back fall it'll, back into yes, that exactly. same uh, category that around 150 dollars is the best bang for buck uh, what were you going to uh, say, Dave? Two things. So, yeah. Um, one, there's a K, there's one of the Liang Ma KUFs on Blade Forms right now for 345 But two, mm-hmm. great story about the guy that designed the K2. Um, what's oh, his yeah. name? Oh, yeah. Farid Mayer. Far- Farid Mayer. So there was supposed to be a smaller version of that. But him mm. and Sal got into a fight on Blade Forums, and he was just Uh-oh. like, no, cancel the whole thing. <laughs> oh, so that's why it got discontinued. There's no, there's no. Well, I don't think it sold well, but there was gonna be a smaller version, and ain't no K3 now because they got into some fight like on the public forums. <laughs> no way. What the least professional way to handle can, something? Okay, Dave, you can't. You're no longer allowed to bring up these things without excerpts. Oh, sure. Yeah, let me let me find it. It's great. Yes. <laughs> it's 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 so good just seeing this fight take place in a public forum and Sal, who is generally like the most restrained person in the world, actually is like, uh, what are you doing doing this on the Spider Co forum on Blade Forms? This is weird. Let me find it. Hmm. Yeah. Um That K two though, I've got one. I love that thing. Yeah, that was that's a lot of It's a lot of ten days. It's a, it's a lot, lot of 10, 10 V and titanium for a hundred bucks. Holy it's crap. still not dull. <laughs> we there did. We, we tried to dull that knife. Yeah. It's still like not dull. Two or three times we tried yeah. to dull it. And I'm, I'm not like not doing something stupid. I mean, under normal use, but lots of it. And it's still pretty sharp. Here, this is great. So people asked for an update in like November, 2016. Sal goes, the issues we're dealing with are not regarding the design, but the designer. There seems to be some disagreement regarding trademark issues. We've written with no response. The ball's actually in the designer's court. Sal. Next mm-hmm. post for Reed Mayer. I will pull out of this completely. <laughs> Wait, what? That's it. 
I will pull out of this completely is him severing their agreement. And then, and then Sal responds, hi, Fareed, perhaps you should let, uh, wait, perhaps you should be letting me know rather than public announcements, since I'm the guy in charge. It seems your way, scare quotes, is not working with me. Our attorney is still being paid on this issue. Sal. And that's it. And that, nice. that is the implosion of a knife collaboration. Wow, that's very interesting. So, ain't no little K two coming. Still being paid. See, that was totally better with the exo. Don't you agree? <laughs> mm -hmm. He will yeah. pull out completely, He'll unlike pull out completely. unlike I'll Jake. Pull out completely. Yeah. Oh God, <laughs> we can't escape it. Everything. No, I actually had a custom Freed Mayor that I was on the books for, and when it came up, I was like, "No, I really don't want this anymore." <laughs> well, well, I've I've those seem to have like the worst resale value of all time. In the history of yeah, customer. that that's when I came up when I was finally like a year later, he was like, Hey, you're up. I was like Find nah. someone else, brah. <laughs> nah, I'm good. Mm. It was well. like yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's a whole story. So shout shout out to Free Mayor for ruining your uh ruining your chances of getting another production knife. Good for you. <laughs> Do we... So so there's another maybe we should save that for another topic. It's like people who get on makers lists and then decide to like jump off of them. Uh, I mean, in this case, I think I did the right thing. It was my first and only do, time doing do, it, but... Do you really want to get me going? Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Yes, we do. I'm ready to burn a whole lot of fucking bridges right now. <laughs> All right, maybe we'll save it for next, next uh, episode. You haven't, you haven't had any trouble selling those knives, though. Yeah, that's... No, yeah, I know. It's, it's not that. It's just, you know... These people are ridiculous. Get your act together. You know, I have guys that have, have been on the list... It's like I'm literally their knife is being made as we're as we're talking, and I get an email from them. You know, I don't carry knives that big. I only, you know, are I, you kidding? I, I, like I only based on the size of the knife at this point, I, I only carry knives that are three point two five inches or less. Okay, well, you knew it was three point five when you fucking bought it. Yeah, it was like the whole idea is that it was a three and a half inch knife. That's great. Exactly. Yeah, you know what I mean. So. You but know, I'm, people I'm have starting to keep a fuck you list, and uh, everybody who dish me around goes on the fuck you list. No fucking knife for you. <laughs> there was actually, didn't you actually? <laughs> the knife Nazi. <laughs> My God, there's an actual typhoon Nazi. Mm. You know, there are there are legitimate reasons why you you know a lot of time can pass between yeah. where you decide to get onto the books for a knife and, and you realize you don't want a knife that's worse it. than the production version. <laughs> and and that's part of why I pretty much do things in six month batches. Normally, mm -hmm. you know, this last batch of mini typhoons I did go into a little bit early. I wasn't really prepared to to open the second set of books um, so early. I did it for two reasons. One. Um, is I was just getting hounded by people to get back to get on the, you know, to get one, and at the same time, Daily Badass lost his whole account and everything, and I wanted to try to help him out a little bit, so I did a little advertising with him, and, you know, part of that was getting the books going again, so it um, it just happened a little early, but typically it's a six month wait. So, myself. and that's that's important information because I know a lot of people who are on your books for the next batch of the. Typhoon, who's this is their first custom knife, and mm -hmm. they have to realize, like you know, this uh, the level of communication that you give is is generally not the norm, you know. So you 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 give a lot of communication. You let people know what's up. You know what people know what you're working on, and and you put out a time frame that's usually spot on. Uh, I'm normally pretty close with my time frame. You know, I told everybody when I get back from Blade, that's when I'm going to be starting them, and you know, waiting on water jet a little bit and here and there, you know, things. But overall, in the end, my schedule is normally pretty good, you know. Um, Speaking of which, you were trying a new uh, heat treat, right? Or with a new Yeah, I think I'm going to try Paul Brothers this time. You know, unfortunately, and they've always been good to me. I can't say anything bad about them except for this last, you know, this uh, last couple knives that I sent them, like onesies and twosies of things. Um, things got all fucked up, you know, that, that big fixed blade I made. Yeah. Oh man, um, that thing was cool. RIP. They, they bent the tip on it. And then I don't know if trying to fix it, like, I don't, it almost looks like it, it fell out of the, you know, fell off of where they were hanging it on or something. And it, um, apparently the tip bent and then they got a chip in the blade. So, I mean, I got it out decent. Um, but it's not something I can sell now. Now I got to, you know, I have a lot of fucking time. Until I'll take I it. Set up. <laughs> um, you know, ninety nine percent of the people wouldn't see what I'm seeing on it. They're gonna think it's perfect, but it's it, to me, it's not. You know, um, 
you know, so, you know, when I find that that kind of stuff happens, I think it's time to not that I'm going to not use them anymore, but I want to give maybe have some going at one shop and some but going maybe at another shop. Not you know? use them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> No, I would use them for a lot of stuff, um, sure. and and I'd still use them for blades. But it's just, um, you know, maybe in just a different scenario than the onesie twosie stuff. So, but to to give an, um, Paul Brothers a try, which is supposed to be a fantastic place, um, instead of doing all the blades this time, like normally, typically I do all my orders. I'll do every blade that I have to make. Um, the problem is, you know, when I'm making so many blades, that could take, you know, three weeks a month to make all those blades. Mm-hmm. It's hard to wait three weeks or three weeks or a month to be getting paid for anything, you know. So this time, um, what I'm doing is doing it in different batches. So I'm not quite following the order exactly the way it's supposed to be, um, but I believe it's going to help everybody in the long run and get these done faster. So what I'm doing is like right now I'm doing all the drop points, mm -hmm. and the drop points are going to go to Paul Brothers, and why why they go out to Paul Brothers? Then I'm going to work on the next batch. Um, and get some frames going. So just things start going, you know, a little bit better time frames. So I'm hoping it's going to work out. Should be cool. Yeah. So would you, would you say, what's the percentage uh, this time going in of drop points versus other blade shapes? Um, it was, it's funny because I looked at all the data and it was like exactly the same as it was for the <laughs> first batch. Interesting. <laughs> um, it was like 50% were drop points. Um, 30% were Japanese Tanto and, you know, um, and then if you start breaking into Harpoon and stuff, you know, it starts getting, you know, things start getting even more crazy numbers. But um, it pretty much mimicked exactly what happened the first time around. So, Dave, what is your objection to that Japanese Tanto shape? I know you I don't just, like the I standard. just don't like Tantos in general. I don't like two edges. I like a single continuous edge. It's just easier to sharpen and it works better, I think. It's not, nothing. I don't have any wild hot take on that. No, nobody, n n none of the drop point fanboys do. They always say they just hate tantos. They don't know why. <laughs> they just don't like them. No, I don't have a hot take. I think it's just I don't like having two cutting edges. I mean, like I can I can honestly see, see like like I, I like a tanto blade. You know, aesthetically, sometimes on a knife it works better. But I can see, like, having a working knife, you'd want to have a drop point or something with a little bit of belly. But as someone who actually uses their mini Typhoon with that Japanese Tanto, freaking awesome. I mean, like, I'm sure it works. I just, it's not my yes. preference. But. Well, I wasn't really just sing singling you out, Dave. I was just yeah, I'm just, talking I don't, about I don't that blade any, shape in any general. Any Tantos for that reason, but, you know, more power to you. Should we get into sharpening? Last topic? If we must. Yeah. So, sharpening. This is kind of an important one. This is one thing where you can either decide you want to invest the time and money into doing it yourself because it will take a lot of both. Um, it's not something that you just pick up and can do immediately, even though it kind of looks like that. Um, you can either choose to do it yourself or just use one of the good people like Razor Edge Knives, Josh, over there to sharpen your knives. Or there's a guy on Blade Farms called Jason B who will sharpen them by hand on water stones if you'd like really want a lot of care taken. And there's plenty of other people on Instagram that sell that do Wicked Edge and whatnot. But if you want to Just do it yourself, look at what they do first. Because yes. I see a lot of hacks out there. Too. Oh, there's a lot of hacks. Yeah, I, I heard don't, about. Don't don't start off sending them your you know your two thousand dollar knife. No, send them a piece of crap first. Yeah, mm. I think one of the most important things is I'm not really a great sharpener. I don't I don't think I'm fantastic. But I think one important thing for people to know is the difference in abrasives so that you don't waste a bunch of time using the wrong kind of stone or abrasive material on your knife. And there's kind of like four, five different categories uh, of abrasives. And the most basic one is aluminum oxide. So that's where like a lot of sandpaper is. And that works pretty good on low carbide steels or like softer steels. Um, so, you know, steels without a lot of vanadium that's fine and that's what like uh the synthetic water stones when you see those japanese water stones they're always aluminum oxide like the the shaptons and the, and the uh, uh nanua or whatever those those are all aluminum oxide those are good for like s35en and below in terms of carbides then you have silicon carbide which there's a lot of cheap silicon carbide stones like the norton crystallons which like you know a lot of people will buy because they're like 20 bucks and those can actually cut pretty hard steel so those are actually quite good for higher carbide steels, but you can't usually find them above like 400 grit. 
So you can end up with a very like sort of coarse edge. And then you have diamonds, which is kind of in vogue now. And you have like bonded diamonds and uh, diamond adhesive diamonds. So bonded diamonds are very, very rare. So we'll just talk about adhesive diamonds. So like DMTs, which, or the Wicked Edge Stones, or those are adhesive diamonds. So it's just a piece of steel or aluminum with some diamonds kind of put on the top. So those can wear out if you use too much force. Uh, and once those are worn out, there's no refreshing them or anything. They're, you basically throw them out. And I think, <laughs> Brian, you mentioned you've gone through quite a few uh, Wicked Edge diamond stones, right? Thousands of dollars worth. Yep, because that's that's kind of what happens with, with the ad adhe uh, adhered, the adhesive ones. Like you said, you could, if you don't put much pressure, and you really don't have to. No, you're, you're not supposed if, to. If, if you're doing a knife for yourself, you know, when you're doing 150 knife, knives every six months, you're I'm putting, you know, literally I'm pushing down on these things hard, you know. Yeah. And um, basically what I kind of do is as they start wearing, you know, I consider that like the next grit. and I just throw the big one behind it. Again. Yeah, they're not they're not totally yeah. worthless. Yeah. And then uh, you have CBN. So CBN stones are like the newest ones and probably the most expensive, which is cubic boron nitride, which is harder than synthetic diamonds. And you can use them dry. They're awesome, but they're really expensive. So mm. CBNs can cut like all steels, but they are quite expensive. The nice thing is that there's this website called Gridomatic, and they're importing a lot of sharpening stuff from Russia and Ukraine, and stuff is a lot cheaper there. So they have CBN stones coming from the Ukraine, which are much more reasonably priced. And by reasonable, I mean like $60 per Edge Pro wow. stone. So not that cheap. Hmm. But those are great. Those basically have no downside. Uh, and then you have like the Spider Coast ceramics, sintered ceramics. Those are great. I would highly recommend those. And then the last... And I think that's a great uh, starter sharpener, too, yeah. is that Spider Coast sharp maker. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then the last, the last category is natural stones like Arkansas, and those on modern steels like pow, like you know powder metallurgy, powder metallurgy steels, uh, aren't great. So just don't even bother with Arkansas stones. And uh, yeah, that's the basic types of abrasives. So if you're going to be using things with above four percent ven uh, vanadium, so like M390, S90, S110V, any of those crazy steel tool steels, you'll probably want diamonds or cubic boron nitride. Everything else you can get away with aluminum oxide and silicon carbide. And that's probably the best way to, uh, the best rule of thumb there. The key is just don't let the blade get so bad where you have to do a lot of work to it. Just touch yeah. it up all the time. Like if you just strop it, yeah. you know, all the time, it's, it's pretty good. Yeah, get yourself a Spyderco Ultra Fine Stone and just touch your knife up very regularly and then strop it. And you won't have to deal with this, with the whole process of sharpening. Unless the knife comes with a terrible edge and then that's a whole thing. Having to reprofile knives is really mm -hmm. annoying. Um, I mean, there's the whole idea of of what is an edge and what are you doing when you're sharpening a knife. I think that if we're going to get really technical, I think a lot of people need to realize what the actual process is, I, why you're doing what you're doing. I think Jake would love to answer that. So Yeah, and I think more and more, um, really, this should be broken down into two segments maybe for another show. Mm -hmm. um, because... It, the amount of discussion between the types of abrasives and when to use uh, certain types of edges and then the just the systems themselves and how to choose um you know basically what to look for when you're shopping uh, yeah. that that is an entire conversation i think we should focus yeah, let me know when that's that going to all, so all four of us can <laughs> all four of us can really add something to that so maybe we should separate the, the science the, yeah yeah, we'll put the science here and then and then do the application um, so that Levon doesn't fall asleep. Yeah, or, or why don't we do the opposite? <laughs> let's, let's talk about the sharpening systems instead of, like, the science of sharpening in too much depth because I think that might lose people. Okay, yes. so you, you want to do... What do you want to... Which would you like to talk about tonight, then? I think we should talk about the sharpening systems because I you, think that's... You want to talk systems right now? I think that probably... We could, I mean... If you want to very briefly explain what you do when sharpening, I think we. Can I, I think that would be good because it adds some context yeah. uh, for people that uh, are are listening, as you call them, casuals, because filthy. it's a good balance. Fil filthy casuals. Filthy casuals. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. It's, you know my line. It's a it's a good. I'm trying to just keep that balance, but I think I think you're mm -hmm. you're right, Dave. Yeah. Yeah, because there's there are um, there's two very distinct. Uh, purposes that we're talking about, like I uh, referenced earlier, you know, whether 
it's part of the hobby for you or it's uh, sort of an annoyance that you um, you just have to do. And that, in, in my practice, in my experience, um, completely changes the way that I would recommend, um, you know, how, how to shop for a system. Um, completely. So, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm trying to think about which, which way to go <laughs> with this. Um, so maybe let's just say I've used everything from um, the, let's see, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, the uh, beloved Cuisinart sharpener. I think that might've been my first, I know probably a pull through, like one of those ceramic uh, pull throughs might've been the first thing I ever used to sharpen. But I very distinctly remember before knives were a, a hobby, it was a really big deal that I felt like every knife I picked up was dull. And that was, and that goes for kitchen knives and pocket knives and, you know, even razor blades. It was like you use it once and then it was dull. And, and you know, I used to work with my stepdad installing carpet or something like that. And, and, you know, I would just be uh, irritated. I, I'm like, I'd be like, how can you keep cutting with that thing? It's so dull. It's not working. Anymore. So <clears throat> I, I remember at a young age start sort of exploring, but with absolutely no, um, I had no, I had no basis for any of this. I just wanted everything to be sharp. So, uh, the, what we now know is like one of the worst things you can do to, to these blades is, you know, what goes on inside of a Cuisinart sharpener. Yep. Um, all, all the way up to and including today, um, I, I use a sort of modified version of my Wicked Edge, just a hacked Wicked Edge, basically, um, with with brief uh, – I shouldn't even say brief, but I also rely on some, um, some powered – not systems per se, but, you know, the equivalent of like a paper wheel on a grinder. Um, you know, occasionally I, I, I'll use an actual grinder to, to start an edge if it's really that far off. Um, I put a lot of knives onto my Wicked Edge and find that the factory grind is, is like, you know, 18 degrees on one side and 22 degrees on the other side. And it's so bad that it's visible and they, they do end up having to be um, reprofiled to get, you know, to get what I want out of it. So... Uh, this, and this is just a really long-winded way of saying that, you know, to shop for a sharpener, you must first ask yourself the question, is sharpening going to be part of uh, part of your what you enjoy about the hobby, or is it going to be an annoyance? Because if it's going to be an annoyance, chances are you just get a Spyderco Sharp Maker and, and nothing else, and, and a strop maybe, and that's as far as you should ever really go, um, and don't get into reprofiling and, and don't spend the money on um, guided systems and things of that nature, because if, if you're not enjoying it, then, um, uh, you've missed the point. Um, I, my first guided system was a Lansky and I did that actually before, probably before I was really experimenting with making knives mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, grinding something beyond, a, um, a primary bevel, you know, actually putting a secondary, a new secondary bevel on a knife, like an old machete or something like that. I did, you know, that's probably what I've spent more time than anything else doing um, before I had a guided system. And I, I learned a lot on the Lansky. I learned a lot just by not raising a burr because <laughs> I attacked some things without watching YouTube first or without having like an uncle or a dad or someone teach me how to use a whetstone when I was little. Um, you know, and with a guided system like a Lansky, you can, do great things and terrible things and everything in between. Um, but you do have to have some kind of interest in what you're doing. You know, a lot of people like to just count the number of swipes. Um, but I really find that that's not enough because so, so many knives vary so wildly uh, in, in the way they come from the factory. So um, so that's, that's the, the at least the first thing that I want to put out there is it's not so much that there is a one sharpener is better than another. The first question is, you know, how do you, how do you want to use the thing? Um, you know, cause that, that really changes my opinion. Um, how do you guys use your sharpeners or do you like to use a sharpening service or where do you I'd stand? Le Levon, you don't count cause I just sh sharpen your knives. <laughs> hey, listen, I'm <laughs> dabbling. I'm dabbling. I'm learning. Yeah. Yeah. Have Sorry, I been I, a good, I interrupted someone. Have I been a good student? Um, no. <laughs> Fine. I'm, I'm yeah. kidding. You're, you're the best. Oh, so. I love everything about you. Uh, 
<laughs> I did. I noticed so, you're a great student because you had fun learning the first time we actually talked about um, not just the theory behind different shapes and, and different angles, but the first time we actually sat down and, and you know, tried to sharpen a knife, you have half the front half of the blade is sharp and the rear half of the blade, the burr is still all the way off to one side. Mm -hmm. So it's a great teaching uh, opportunity for the next time we sit down with your little G10 dragonfly. That's my official answer. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've ran the gamut on sharpener. So I had the sharp maker, the work sharp, an edge pro, and a wicked edge, and I have settled on freehanding as what I find the most, uh, the most versatile, really. So I, I like I said, I don't like reprofiling knives. So I like generally, unless the factory edge is really, really terrible or like extraordinarily obtuse, um, I'll generally try and stick with the factory edge. And following, so all knives at factories are sharpened by hand. So there's going to be some natural variance in the edge, and it is much easier to account for that variance when you are sharpening freehand than it is with a fixed angle system where you cannot account for that at all. You just have to reprofile, which is good because then you have a very clean, very symmetrical edge. However, you have to spend a ton of time getting rid of the steel. So, yeah, one of the, one of the ones I'm actually interested, I might, I might uh, buy the Hapstone, which is like an edge pro improvement coming out of the Ukraine, I think, or maybe Russia. And it's it's kind of just like the Edge Pro, but uh, it has a bunch of things that are slightly better about it. Like, you can use any stones and, you know, just other little improvements that make me interested in it. But I generally try to avoid fixed angle sharpeners, even though they are uh, certainly easier, I think. Freehanding is, it's not as tough as it sounds, but, like, it's also a, a lot of practice because you have to do weird things with your hands. If you're not ambidextrous... Um, you know, when you're sharpening the reverse side of a knife, it's always going to be a, a more awkward motion. So it's something yeah, I it's even, even when even just stropping, I see people really get a great motion with their right, and they go to use their left, and they just cut the strop or something. Like yeah, that. it's really it's very different. Uh, yeah. You're so so it's, when you're freehanding, it's much easier to sharpen if you're right-handed. It's much easier to sharpen what would be the lock side on a frame lock, so the the <laughs> reverse side of the knife than it is the presentation side, just because the the motion is a lot just easier cutting towards you than cutting away from you but yeah i guess i would recommend the sharp maker i i think the sharp maker is not that useful truthfully because it only has two angles and if your knife is not exactly those angles you are literally doing nothing with it you are mm -hmm. either just grinding at the apex and putting on a micro bevel um or you are just grinding at the shoulder of the edge and doing nothing so i think the, the sharp maker is a little misleading for newbies to be picking up because it will likely not do anything for them unless the knives they have have perfect 15 or 20 degree edges i'll i'll come with you halfway there and say for a newbie who doesn't know whether they're grind hacking away at, at the apex or, or the back of the edge that's an issue yes but if you if you really don't want to spend time a micro bevel is actually a great thing true because it's it's sort of a just that just a half step beyond a strop or or if you know if you're at a point where stropping isn't working i find that a micro bevel for if you just want to get back if you literally if you're in the middle of uh, a task and you just want to get back out there and, and finish a micro bevel really is the best the best way to do that so um that is the application where i say the sharp maker is is the the best option for someone who really just wants to you know swoosh swoosh and get get back out there or or uh you know get yeah. on with their or, or you can do what i do day or job what i did was i learned freehand by taking the stones out of the sharp maker and just using them by hand because they're good yeah. ceramic stones they're that great makes sense. Sure. Mm -hmm. they're great but yeah. powered sharpeners i would definitely warn people like you know paper <laughs> wheels and the work sharp definitely going to warn people about using those because it's really easy to mess stuff up with those like very mm. very quick Things go it's wrong. It's also easy to have fun with cheap knives. Yes, very true. <laughs> so, you know, to be fair, for, for every every system, almost every system has, has some kind of purpose. The, the, and if there, if you can include a cheap knife, then then it can be fun. The the work sharp, the Ken Onion one, has a variable speed motor, but apparently if you run it at the low speed too much, it'll destroy the motor. So, like, that only sort Ooh. of takes care of your problem of grinding away the tip immediately <laughs> in one bad yeah, pass on a work sharp. They're just not... They're just not accurate enough. They're made for like you know that twenty dollar machete that you'd buy at Walmart. Yeah, that would be that's what's perfect for that. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Whereas the exact Not opposite. A little fallers. Yeah. But the exact opposite is the Tech Studio Professional. If people haven't yeah. heard of that, it's this ridiculous knife sharpener that's outrageously over engineered from Russia. Um, that is basically like I would a combination. Say it's just right engineered. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> It, I it, love that. It, it's basically like a KME on steroids, um, and it has a lot of ridiculous engineering. And but the thing is about it is there's been some controversy. So there was there's this one YouTuber named Wrangle Star, and he plugged it, and then after that the prices shot up. So there's some uh, rumors of Russian collusion. Sounds mm. kind of familiar. In Soviet <laughs> Russia, knife shot a few. Yeah, so now they start at like four hundred ninety dollars, which is wild because it really is like over engineered for what you're doing but that that's like the dream if you want to really go balls deep into sharpening get the i would studio. still buy that over the tops folder uh, absolutely that'd be a way better investment <laughs> and take that 10 bucks and do something something fun with it yeah you know, nice to, actually no you buy one of those uh what's the what's that kershaw you can get for 10 bucks the now? injection the in injection. injection there you go buy 50 of those boom we've come full circle mm -hmm. yeah um, some YouTube channels I would recommend, though, like, for learning to sharpen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hate that I'm doing this because I fucking hate this guy, and this doesn't mean the beef has ended, but Jay Davis, 882, back when he was doing sharpening tutorials, he did a very, very good job of explaining what sharpening is and how to do it, especially freehand. So I got to go with him. Um, I know mostly freehand people, so maybe other people can respond. Michael Christie is another yeah. super knowledgeable guy about freehand sharpening. Uh, and then Jeff Jewell is another guy who tries out like every mm -hmm. possible bench stone you can find. So if you need some insight there. And then on Blade Forums, there's a guy named Jim Ankerson, who is like the most knowledgeable person about sharpening I've ever seen. What about the Apostle P? Uh, no comment. <laughs> nah, I'll pass. Um, and Cliff Stamp, very controversial figure, but he seems to know a lot about sharpening. A lot. No one knows why these people are controversial but you. <laughs> Cliff Stamp is like old school, though. Real old school. He does it um, on an actual rock that he finds outside. He's, I think he's done that. <laughs> Found this here the, rock. I'm going to go sharpen my, my knife, my yeah. Arkansas toothpick. Yeah. So uh, the the thing that I – only thing I want to add uh, – uh, I'm not going <laughs> to – I'm not going to go, go uh, into the depths. If you're, if you're interested at all, there's something to be said for just looking at what – images and video or whatever is available already of the microscopic side of what you yeah, what yeah. we're talking about here the the part of the edge that actually does the cutting um can only be seen with a loop or a microscope and even better uh it, and you don't even have to go as far as reading the whole long lengthy threads where guys uh, have you know really powerful microscopes and and you know they're going into in-depth in conversation about um, the, the use usefulness of the crystals and um, just Google image image search, you know, you know, cutting edge of a blade, you know, under microscope, whatever, whatever you have to do to to find um, some images. If you're in that scenario where a lot of guys are, where you're just shopping, I think that's a good because you know there aren't there's not like a 300 different options. You know, you're either going to get one of these probably four systems. So. Mm -hmm. Um, spend some time doing that and you'll, you'll get a much better feel for where you want to land. You know, do you really want to be able to do the mirror polished edges? Do you really need to be able to do that kind of stuff? Um, and I would, yeah, like I said, just, just go look at how, um, how these things really affect the microscopic part that actually does the cutting. Uh, and that might help you. Yeah. A lot. For sure. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Should I get the hap, the hap stone or should I go all the way and try and get a tech studio professional i don't know without it's... question tech studio is the only way to go it's so ridiculous be... though because <laughs> that way you have to pay for it and i just get to uh i don't know it's hear, hear stories it's so about absurd it that's what you should do with the money that you save from getting off of farid mayor's books <laughs> <laughs> sorry for reed yeah no you know what no not sorry that <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean it's it's crazy expensive, but it looks pretty cool. I mean, some people have been, some people. There's a very long thread. Uh, uh, unsurprisingly, one of the guys I just mentioned, Jim Ankerson, was one of the first people to buy one. Um, so there's a very very long thread about it on Blade Forms. That seems to be like the only real information you can find in English. Um, 
some people, I mean, not a lot of people have posted because they're con- see one of the problems with the tech studio also is that they're constantly updating it and it's really hard to keep track of where they're at with it. They keep yeah. like coming up with fixes for things and like just they just keep posting in this thread and it's really hard to follow like what the current system is and like get feedback from people about it. But like, you know, people in Russia seem to really like it. It's just crazy. It's so expensive. <laughs> a lot of a lot of my enthusiasm is is really just uh tongue in cheek or, or just half joking, I guess. Um uh, I I just love how genuinely old it feels. Yeah, you know what I mean? it comes it, it comes like in it the the crate the mil- the Russian military crate. Yeah, and and it's just so uh, it it just it has some of the things it fixes a few of the things that other sharpeners leave you wanting with like you know the ability to flip the knife while it's still uh, clamped and and that kind of stuff and the really really you know if we get into um, what Brian does for sharpening, he, he uses a um, self-designed system. I would say that that kind of takes pieces from, from other systems and, and I'll leave it at that um, unless he wants to go further, but, you know, lengthening that um, geometrically uh, that the longer that arm is, the less it's going to deflect as you move to different, you know, different uh, parts of the blade and also just uh, different position within that swipe or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, um, and it, it fixes that. And uh, there's just, there are some really, really neat things about it, but as to the price, you know, the base system sounds expensive, but compared to a wicked edge with a, with a couple of higher grit stones, you know, one of the pro packs or even one of the newer design wicked edges with the time joints and um, all that fun stuff. It's actually, yeah, the wicked edge is overpriced, no doubt. So, the way, yeah, um, yeah, it get it gets up there quickly. And again, it's it's just there's something for everyone. You know, yeah. the the wicked edge has a place if it's really a big part the, of the, the hobby for the you, tech and, stu- and you want it. The text you're all looking potential. at is four eighty nine, and it comes with the <clears> silicon <throat> carbide stones, which are apparently very good, actually. Whew, yeah. That is a lot. I don't know. I like the half stone, but it is also is sort of edge proy, and then it has a table but it has a slightly better way of like lining the knife up on the table, but it also has a rotating like KME style thing that you can buy for 140 bucks. Um, but I think I'm going to go with the half stone just cause it's a little bit cheaper and you can get it with these and bonded diamond stones for 280, which is pretty what, good. What about this, this new Viper or something or other that's on, I think like mass drop. Uh, that's just kind of like, it's just very KME ish. It, 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 nah, that yeah. doesn't really do it for me. It looks kind of. It, it didn't look interesting at all, but I I don't know enough to say it, uh, one way or the it other. It just looks like I another Lansky. Saw that it existed. Lansky. Yeah. You know, now I, these I, systems for I'm the sure. price, I love my Lansky. By the way, go on. These systems that you're talking about, you know, typically what or diamonds do they come with? You know, of course, most guys like you who are just going to be resharpening stuff, you don't need fifties and one hundreds and two hundreds. Yeah. You know, you need all the fine mm. shit. Yeah. Well, that's a, well, yeah. The pe- one one to four is what the basic Wicked Edge comes with, and eighty to I don't know a thousand or two thousand is is what I use um, typically. Well, you pe- know, people often make the some, mistake some combination of not using a coarse enough stone to start. Like when a knife is like sure. used to be sharpened, people often use too fine of a stone. So there is some use to getting like relatively coarse stones, but not like you know you and don't I, need the and crazy I think- ones the way that the way that people describe to me how they're going to use their knife and then the the grit that they plan to use is so often two completely different things you know they'll say i want to i want to go out and be able to like you know saw through uh coarse material or you know cut a lot of rope or whatever and then ask for a polished edge yeah and they're two completely different things you know if we're talking about common mistakes you, most people really only need to take their knife up to 400 grit, and it'll perform very, very well. That's what but Jim But if Ankerson there is does. a higher grit available, there's that natural sort of, uh, you know, default to just go as high as possible, where yep. that's actually not the pinnacle of performance. Yeah. Um, by any stretch. Jim Ankerson was was a, was a big Phil Wilson guy who was a knife maker who experimented with a lot of crazy steels. Like he was the first person to make stuff in like S90 and S110, and uh, he finishes all of his knives at 400 grit silicon carbide Mm -hmm. stone which is good for high carbide Mm -hmm. steel so yeah it's not always you don't always need like the half micron finish no of course not it's fun it's fun for uh showing off and and it's great for for uh 
to use as an example, <laughs> you know, when uh, when you're standing around a circle and talking about which sharpener to buy. But ultimately, at the end of the day, most people really should be ending up around 400 grit for the way they use yeah. their EDC knife. Well, the other thing they're doing sorry, is they're making sorry, sorry. their just way too steep. You know, it's um. Oh every, yeah, everyone wants like 13 degrees too. Yeah, and that's, that's make a lot of it, sense. I mean, if, if you know, if you're slicing cold cuts, maybe, but you know, yeah. and if you want that edge to last, you gotta, you know, you gotta give it a little more meat. Yeah, yeah. I, I especially because where I've been uh, looking recently um, at the Hap Forty specifically um, has some really weird um, kind of like ZDP. Uh, where it actually performs better at a really steep angle and it is very hard, but it's still, you know, even at like 65 or 66 Rockwell, I forget what it is. Uh, it's still uh, resists chipping and, and other types of wear yeah, you really could well. Probably put and a, a very acute angle on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's in, it's intended for a kitchen knife that is so thin in the first place that it barely exists. So guys are getting their um, spider coats, you know, indoors and delicas and, and things and, and putting, you know, 13, 14, 15 degree primaries on it. And from what I'm hearing, I haven't done it myself. Uh, I haven't even actually, uh, as an aside, I haven't even had to touch, touch up the edge of my hat 40 uh, delica. And I've been using it like every day for two weeks. So it does seem to be um, as good as everyone says, but um, so I don't have any firsthand, uh, information to offer but from what i've read it is everything that uh it's cracked up to be so yeah i don't know i think i think there that's an even deeper uh version of that's of the same answer of you know it depends what you're going to use it for um some of you know these again like zdp and half 40 are really really high uh, and maximet is another great example really high on the hardness scale completely different um attack as far as plan of attack as far as sharpening and how you plan to use the knife is really going to dictate um you know what sharpener is going to be best yeah i think it's gotten to the point where we're like we're so used to seeing on instagram knives with ridiculous mirror polish bevels that it feels weird to like have a knife with like a 400 crit finish like it just feels like oh this isn't finished uh, uh, yeah. and we've like it's i think this has become so ingrained in our minds like i look at a knife when i've, I've finished off of like the dmt fine and i'm like this looks unfinished, even though it's a perfectly good edge. But yeah, and it, it's yeah. like cars. There's a difference between use and show. I, I, I mean, my 400 is where I my users end. But if it's a knife that spends more time in the drawer, and I, and you know, I just kind of take it or I carry it for like weddings and stuff like that. Sure, that'll have a mirror edge because it doesn't matter. You know, how many teeth per inch does the 400 grit give you? Uh, no idea. <laughs> Well, Brian, you put a pretty good That's mirror dash on the cyclone. Well, again, okay, because to me, 400 grit is actually leaving teeth, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And te teeth are great for yard work, let me tell you. I'm going to leave teeth all <laughs> over sure. this all over this desk because I'm about to, my head's going to hit the freaking thing. Yeah, it's cause... yeah it's, it got really uh, sleepy. That's because you're not cult like us, Levon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah We're true. real cult it's knife addicts. Big. For the record, it was my suggestion to split this up into two different uh, uh, episodes, if you recall. I mean, anyway. To use a buzzword <laughs> from our episodes, I think we're scaring away the filthy casuals, so I'm all for it. <laughs> um, oh, man. I'll let the filthy casuals come to me. All right. Well, you want to do Wing Ding of the Week <laughs> before we wrap up? Oh, God, yeah. Yes. All right. So I'm really excited to do this one. So Wing Ding of the Week, and this one shouldn't upset anyone. I think we can all rally behind this. I think we've had enough divisive Wing Dings. Uh, so this one is going to Photo Bucket for single-handedly right. oh. breaking the fucking internet. So Awful. everyone, I mean, so let, let's talk about how this relates to knives. So knife forums, um, you know, a lot of repository for great information. You can see the you know, what people have been selling knives for. You can see the prices. You can learn through tutorials that are in images. You can show off your new knives. And what was the hosting service that almost everyone used? Photo Bucket, because it was great. It was free. It allowed you to upload a lot of stuff. I mean, the website was super slow and shitty, but it allowed you to upload pictures for free. It so, was also the one that was used for it, the past two, like, decade and a half. Yeah, yeah it was, like it was the one old. that was there when we when we started hosting photos and yep. reposting IMGs. So 
people have <sighs> people have Terrible. tons of years of photos. I mean, I can go back in my photo bucket and look at knives I used to own, and I'm like, wow. I, I remember back when I thought this was like the greatest thing since sliced bread. So anyway, Photo Bucket, realizing the strain of having a freemium model, decided out of nowhere to withhold the ability to embed images on websites unless you pay $400 a goddamn year. Single-handedly breaking like billions of photos that have been embedded on forums. So now every I, old like uh... knife sale post on Blade Forums, all the pictures are gone. Uh, like sharpening tutorials where you like, if you want to see what the bevel looks like under a hundred times magnification, gone, everything's gone. gone and it fucking this is, sucks. This you know, is so, it's... so much bigger than, than the knife hobby. Yeah. This yeah, is, totally. This is the forum form. The discussion Apocalypse. forum format yeah. is uh, compl in so many ways destroyed because so much of what we use for, like you said, the repository of information for every hobby under the sun, mm -hmm. even stuff that I, you know, for school, I'm still going back and, and looking at discussion forums to learn uh, rapidly to, you know, gather information. This is a destruction that goes so much deeper than just whether or not we can enjoy our hobbies with pictures or not. I really hope there's enough backlash that somehow this is reversed. Or someone just gives them I enough think, money to shut them up and 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 have them turn our our history back on. I because think because that's really the, what they're taking away is our history. You've hit the nail on the head, Jake. This is one of those times where I I this is a company testing the waters with how much power they have. That's what's going to happen. They're yeah, going to they're precisely well. I think what's going to happen is you're going to see them turn everything back on, um, within the month. Uh, oh, God. this is this is it's it's just showboating it's saying look at what you, it's a it's a service that people questionably have taken for granted um mm -hmm. for a long time and this is them saying look what happens when we take this away yeah you okay know? i hadn't thought of it like that but that's, that's a, great i mean it's not great because it's you know it's kind of like a bit of uh you know we're still here so you better you better pony up some dough it's kind of, it's mm -hmm. a cat it's partially a cash grab and and a show of power uh i i have a feeling that it's something that will uh sort of fizzle out within the within the oh, i hope but to god <laughs> if yeah. if the options are it's it's a it's unethical showboating cash grab versus the the alternative is um the people who make up that repository would have to go back and rehost and repost all their photos. That's we never going to happen. Absolutely no never gonna way. No, no. Ever, like maybe two threads out of every 10,000 are going to be fixed. Uh, the, the rest of the, the, the um, discussion forum part of the internet is just going to be ruined. So I mean, I, I really hope there's a global, a global re revert. Work, thing working this. for a tech company, I've been boycotting any sort of image hosting for a long time. I really hated the idea of using forums for this reason because you don't have any control over the stuff that you're posting. Plus, like Jake, you remember the? I mean, the pictures that I had on my photo bucket were probably from our, our car meet days. You know what I mean? Likewise. And that's what I think. Company things like Instagram have sort of taken the reins um, because mm -hmm. it's so instantaneous, and and honestly, more sc scrupulous. Is that the right word? Yeah. Yeah, then then something like an image hosting thing. Uh, you know, if you look at Reddit, like things like Imager or Imger are, are kind of following that same business model, but it's kind of a mix. It's sort of a midway point between what Instagram does and what PhotoBucket has done. Uh, I just don't think it's good for, for anything. Yeah, really. well, image, Imger <laughs> is the solution for right now. Right. In this forum apocalypse, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Ugh, You're going to just run into the same problem later. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, the freemium model right. never works. Is SoundCloud is collapsing for the same reason because they couldn't mm -hmm. monetize. But yep. now we but, have the, small, I mean, the internet startup report. There, there's, no, there's no end to the discussion of how many issues, how unfair and just how stupid it is to take away the years so, and years can, and, and can, millions can I... of hours. I mean, for personally, I've just out of the kindness of my heart... I've made threads of, you know, how to is on certain parts of, like I used to, like I, I always say, I used to work in the automotive industry that, you know, I had a lot of inside information that, that people wouldn't have if I didn't go and just give it away and in, in the form of 
write-ups or tutorials with photos, of course. And it's a shame for for all those things to to disappear, no matter whether you know it's a cash cash grab or a bad format or whatever. That stuff really just you know it mm-hmm. belongs out there. Sorry, what were you going to say, Brian? I don't remember. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> that was good. Well, the Sharp by Design website is still intact because they're probably yeah. hosted. I mean, it would be cheaper for someone to just buy hosting and put and put their pictures up on there. You can do it with right. Uh, you can do it with iCloud. You know, if you have right. an iPhone, you can do this stuff with the stuff that you already have. Yeah, and Google Photos. For Google Android Photos, people. sure, absolutely. Mm-hmm. See, I haven't seen this even. This hasn't even affected me at all because no. anytime I do a search to look on something, I'm going to a form. If I see like the date is, you know, old, I don't even look at it. <laughs> I see the old shit. I mean, <laughs> I can see that point too, but there's a lot of stuff. You're also not in in. You're not a collector either. You don't you don't find enjoyment of going and looking at. You know, knives. <laughs> yeah, on the collector side, this is more devastating. Correct, and especially for cars, which is a a billion dollar industry where people sure. need to go and look up how to fix the distributor on their 1964 Porsche or whatever. I mean, okay, maybe that's a bad example because they'll have someone else do it, but everyone else in the world really needs to see all that information. <laughs> it's it's just, it's a horrible loss. And I really, yep. it, the, the answer is not for the individuals to go and pay $400 a year to restore the service. It's, it you know, it needs to get rolled into a much bigger picture. Correct. And I don't care if money comes out of my pocket you know, for that to happen, but I can't pay to affect any more than my own. No way. Uh, and, images, and, so. and two, here's another thing. Forum software in general Ugh. is antiquated as hell. Yes. Like, generally there's a lot of stuff that sh- that's on forums that should have been put onto other forms of media long, t- a long time ago. And I say things about, th- we can say all, all the things we want about Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, but they truly are better solutions than forums. Mm, they don't, but the, the content isn't permanent. That's the problem. It is on YouTube, but like Facebook, you can't go back and search in like, like, so I, I belong to some Facebook knife groups. I don't, and it's not like my favorite thing, but like you can't, the stuff goes away. And so forums have a purpose. They're like a repository. I, I agree. I, I understand what you're saying, but the point is you can, you can make a forum better. Yes. That's Much. all I'm saying sure. is that the idea, the ideas that we can take from, from Facebook and, and Instagram and YouTube is that, you know, there's a purpose for it. Yeah, mm-hmm. certainly. Anyway. All right. Well, it's been a long episode, so. Oh my God. We wrap it up. Absolutely. <laughs> well, this was I, I found it informative. I dozed off only four times. Um <laughs> which is good. Uh but I'm just kidding. It was really great. I enjoyed I enjoyed listening to you guys. Um and you know, I definitely learned something too. Uh, it's a too. it's a little different. I hang out with, with with most of you, you know, regularly, but it's really great to see you guys interacting and 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 talking about stuff that actually matters, you know. I'm gonna fucking cry. <laughs> That's why kisses, we made the podcast. Kisses, kisses and hugs. Go team. Go team. Um, but thank you, everyone who it was now is who actually was able to stay asleep, stay awake and and listen to this this whole uh, thing. We would like to hear your feedback on on uh, if we should continue down this path of. Uh, you know, factual content. And we're going to try and walk that line a little bit. Hopefully you laughed a little bit during this too. Yeah. It's either factual content or wildly inflammatory statements. So you guys pick. (laughs) 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 Oh, on that note, um, let's see, what do we have coming down the podcast pike? Uh, Um, The interview with the guys from blade HQ, I believe on August 7th, August 7th, we'll have those guys come through. Um, Sebastian Berengi, Borka Blades himself, will be coming on. Um, another thing I wanted to nail down is something with our boy uh, Matt Diskin. Uh, let's see, who else? Well, we got a lot of people coming. Um, and we, we've actually got a, a lot of new knives coming through uh, our possession. So we'll give you our feedback on those as well. Yep. 
Neat. Yep. Well, we'll see you guys soon. We're going to, you know, we maybe tell people where to find us. <laughs> we can. I mean, I feel like everybody knows where to find us at this point, but sure let's do it. So. Go ahead, Levon, you're first. Well, yeah. you guys know me. I'm Meta Levon, M E T A L 1 L E V O N on Instagram and various other social media outlets. I am Dave. I'm underscore misanthropia on Instagram, misanthropia on blade forums on YouTube, uh, and check us out at knifenuts.net. Oh yeah, yeah so we I'm have still... a website. Sorry. <laughs> yep. For now, I'm still whiskey pickle Jake, but I really want to go with knife nuts Jake. So, look for both. And I'm Brian, and I don't want you finding me anywhere. I don't want to talk to any of you. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs>